I'd like to welcome you to our age tech meeting. Developing and accelerating age tech and digital health solutions. We are here to focus on perspectives and insights from some tremendous C-suite leaders. Again, your feedback is important. So I'm just gonna ask you to click that link open. We are trying to get to 100% participation. So if you can feel free to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. I also wanted to note that we have another great event coming up for you if you wanna continue your learning and experience. It's called Pitching and Promoting the Company. This is part of our Entrepreneur Workshop Series in coordination and co-hosted with the NIA as well as NHLBI. So you'll be able to hear from some experts in the field on uh, preparing for pitching to VCs, to thinking about your customers and your market and getting your communications infrastructure in order. Please register for that webinar if you're interested and it is free. So today we're really having the second part of a two-part series on NIH tech and digital health solutions. Our goal is to really help research entrepreneurs and biotechs learn those insights and best practices that are going to help support your work in the longevity economy and understanding the market. We've got some experts here that are focused solely on helping you develop and position your solutions with the idea that will help you think through an impactful business model. We have a range of other events that have covered all kinds of topics from uh, patent to reimbursement, all the things that you think can, can think of as you're starting your business and trying to bring things to market. You can go to the NIA Office on Small Business Research Archive Events page and we'll chat that link. And we also want you to know that it's not just a webinar we're offering, but we have experts that are available to help you. So if you are an NIA awardee, John Reinhardt is our uh, entrepreneur in residence, along with Diane Ignar. They're both available to help you for one-on-one -on -one meetings to help and have more in-depth one-on-one conversations and coaching sessions. So I am chatting out to you and my colleague, through my colleague, Kiara, uh, to help you get that link. So you'll see a Calendly link. We actually have the ability so that you can schedule those one-on-ones while you're here. So feel free to grab a uh, time with John and uh, we'd be happy to have a coaching session with you. With that, uh, I wanna go over our workshop format. It's a little bit different than usual. We have a three part session. And so you'll have a first panel uh, that is put, focused on providers and we'll talk about building pilot partnerships and obtaining customers. That's in this hour. During the next hour, we'll be focusing on uh, accelerating, creating successful value propositions and profitable business models. We'll also have an investor and distributor scaling your venture session. So please stick around with us uh, so that we can go through all these great opportunities and you can see details about each under that uh, title. Next slide, please. So uh, our panels for this particular hour are some experts from across the age tech field. And I am delighted to welcome Jill Vitali Awesom. She is the president and CEO of Christian Living Communities. We're also joined by Dr. Lynn Katzman. She's the president and CEO of Juniper Communities. We have Steve Hendricks, who is the chief executive officer of the Homestead Louisville. And uh, John Reinhardt is gonna be our moderator for today. Thank you, John. And I welcome all of our speakers. Thanks, Monique, and thanks to all of you for joining us. This is a great time to talk to thought leaders, key opinion leaders, and, and actually the organizations that are leading the way in services and innovations for our uh, longevity economy uh, residents. So today we're going to start, and I'm going to start with uh, each one of our panelists, and I'm going to ask them to introduce their organization, a general uh, knowledge about their communities, their residents, uh, some of the services they provide. And let's just from our last webinar, we're going to try to equate sort of this, the areas we talked about to real world communities that are that are offering this uh, in their markets and what markets you're in, please. So I'll start with Jill. Jill, why don't you share about CLC, Christian Living Communities, and tell us a little bit about the organization, who you serve, and the kinds of communities and residents that you are, are engaged with. Sure. I'm glad to be here with all of you today. 
So Christian Living Communities is a nonprofit organization. And through a comp, so we own some of our communities and we do third party management for some of our communities. So we have 22 uh, different communities that we either own or support in six states. Um, and we have a wide range of services. So we have um, four community, actually, no, we have five communities that are life plan or those continuing care retirement communities with all the different levels of living there. Um, and then we have a number of standalone assisted living and memory support communities, um, 155 plus uh, apartment building, and we also have home care services. Um, and we also serve a wide range of uh, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds. So we do a lot of private pay as well as Medicaid and we have um, HUD affordable housing at one of our campuses as well. Great. Uh, Lynn, you want to share a little bit about Juniper? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, Juniper has been around for 33 years. We are an owner operator of uh, senior living and long term care communities. Right now, we have 30 properties in four states. Uh, Texas, Colorado, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, and it's a long story of how we got into such different parts of the country. Um, we provide a host of different services across the senior living continuum, from independent living services all the way through short-term rehab services, and uh, everything in between, including assisted living and memory support, as, as does Jill's company. Uh, we also have uh, several large campuses that include all aspects of, of the continuum. The residents we serve uh, are largely older adults. Surprisingly, the age span is not as different as you would think, including everything from independent living to through skilled nursing. Um, the average age in independent living is in the mid to, well, mid 80s. It's slightly higher for assisted living and slightly higher yet for skilled, but it is all within uh, roughly a decade or so, which is very different than what most people uh, think when they think about independent living versus skilled. Uh, in terms of revenue sources, we are largely private pay, but do accept Medicare and in some cases, Medicaid. Fantastic. Uh, Steve? Yeah, hi, John. Thanks for the opportunity to participate in the panel and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Steve Hendricks, uh, CEO here at Home Instead Louisville. Uh, home in it's a franchise model. Home Instead is the largest home care uh, company nationally and internationally, and, and Louisville is one of the largest uh, franchises in the network. Um, been here actually just since April of this year. We've spent a uh, last uh, couple decades with a couple of large uh, providers of services uh, for both people with disabilities and home care operations, uh, but became owner CEO here at uh, Louisville in April of this year. We serve uh, primarily, uh, we, we provide home care services to almost 300 seniors in our market. And primarily that's uh, companionship, light housekeeping, and then personal care services for those folks. And our primary funding streams are private pay, long-term care insurance, and then we also do some Medicaid and, and VA services. Uh, so that's um, who we are and, and, and what we do. Right, so it's been my, it's been my belief that innovation starts with the leadership and starts at the top. And so when I think of innovative communities and cultures and organizations and uh, thought leadership, I think of culture and I think of focus, right? So innovation is supposed to be unrestricted. It's unfeathered. It's, you know, ideation. But then when it comes to solving real challenges, it has to be some serve a need or serve a purpose. And it could be just experimental. But uh, let's go to back to Jill and talk about how your culture and some of the areas that you're focused on and, and some of the areas that you're interested in as it relates to a researcher, an entrepreneurial team, uh, just a venture group that's thinking, I want to do something and I want to solve something. What would you, what would, advice would you give them and where would you point them and tell us how your company looks at that? Um, well, we, we've been around for 50 years. And one of the reasons I think we've been successful is we're a learning organization. So we, we never say we've got it all figured out. And I would run away from anybody who says they do have it figured out because it's never true. Um, and, you know, we really focus on um, 
for technology, for example, or any kind of innovations, we don't want innovation or technology for the sake of innovation or technology. Um, is it going to solve one of our needs? So big challenges right now is workforce, right? So how can things, so we're very focused on how can technology um, help us with efficiencies? Where, where can we use technology and where do we need people? Um, and then anything we also look at is has to improve quality of life for our team members or in our residents and things that um, really focus on um, efficiency. And I would say, you know, one of the, the really important things to understand, I think, for, for anybody in this space of, of senior living and aging services is, um, is adoption. Um, and we see this happen quite a bit where um, technology will bring in um, a new technological solution and there is an adoption and it fails. Um, and so really understanding um, the reality of the people who are using the, usually using the technology, either the residents or the people who are directly caring for them. And companies coming in really need to uh, understand how important it is for our team members and residents to actually own it so the adoption actually works. Otherwise, it's a, it's a waste of resources. Um, so that's a really important thing. And the companies that come in and understand that and have resources and tools to help us with adoption um, usually are, end up being better partners. Yeah, that's great. Steve, now how would that change when I go to residents' homes and their families in, in, in the home care business in the community? You know, they have some differences than the home care, but explain to us your culture and how you look at uh, innovation and what are your needs? Right. So, you know, the everything Jill said is the same in terms of, you know, workforce is is our biggest challenge. And uh, what I would say then, you know, in our world, what, what becomes uh, an add-on to that is, is that whole, how do you engage a remote workforce? So I think technology that, that assists you with how you engage that workforce is something we would always be very interested in because that's one of our biggest challenges because we've got 250 to 300 caregivers, you know, scattered throughout two counties providing services in homes to people. Uh, so both, you know, both the recruitment, but then, you know, that retention engagement uh, of that remote workforce is, is critical for us. Uh, and then, as Jill said, you know, stuff that's technology that's going to improve quality of life and that whole adoption piece. And again, that becomes another barrier, just like with the caregiver side, you know, engaging and getting clients uh, adopting and utilizing technology is tough enough. And then when you're looking at that from a remote, you know, scattered site uh, type of uh, process, you know, how, what are some ways that you can overcome those barriers uh, to facilitate the engagement and the adoption? And I think that involves the caregiver and involves the family as well as the client. And uh, so what I do when I engage with uh, tech providers is I always bring in my case management team or a couple of the, my case managers, uh, a couple of my caregiver mentors uh, that are here, you know, usually we'll have at least one of each of those here in the office to, to come in and look at technology with me because they're the ones often out in the home you know, where the proverbial rubber hits the road and, and can think about things in a way that I may not. And so part of our culture is to make sure we, we get people closest to the service involved in, in looking at that technology and asking the questions of the tech provider. And uh, because then again, exactly like Jill said, the adoption of it, it may be great, but if the senior's not gonna use it or their family's not gonna use it, uh, then it, it's a waste of time, resources and energy. And uh, figuring out that is, is just critical to, to the success. So I'm gonna go one level deeper with Dr. Katzman and Dr. Oh, Katzman. As a, but as a PhD, a lot of our audience is PhDs, right? A lot of our audience are, are researchers. They are academic researchers and they are entrepreneurial researchers, but they understand the value of research and innovation, right? And I know when I first talked to you about some of the award awardees and the grants and the proof and the stuff they're doing, give me a little insight in terms of how research gets incorporated in, in your mindset and your culture. And, and again, not just because you you know the rigor, but more moreover, because it does have a purpose. And a lot of, I think a lot of our portfolio companies value that they're doing a contribution to science and the research rigor, but they're also trying to do a commercial value to the 
to the market? And how do you th think those, maybe comments on how those might go together in your mind, the value of a research towards a, hello, did you lock up? Uh oh, we lost her. Well, we'll get, we'll come back to Lynn for a second then. All right, so let's uh, let's go on, and when we get Lynn back, we'll have her pick up an answer on that. So, uh, um, Jill, starting back to you, your process of identifying, evaluating pilots, service models, and startups—is it a formal process, an informal combination? What, what, what? If I want to get in and I come to see you, what happens to me? Well, it's a combination of, of formal and informal. And what we started doing a few years ago, um, uh, because we are, you know, we're, we're really kind of bombarded, right, with emails and calls, and you should check out this technology. And what we started doing is quarterly, we call them demo days. And so our team um, is identifying, uh, and they might be at a conference and talking with somebody who's an exhibitor there about this this technology that could meet one of our needs and they'll bring those ideas back our, our uh, vp of information technology is always on the lookout based on what we need operationally and we invite we vet the companies ahead of time and then we invite them to come in and do demo days um, and we include anybody from our organization who wants to come including residents anybody who might have some feedback on whether or not this is a good investment um, and then we really work together to, to determine if this is the right fit. And again, it always has to meet a need. Um, and we, we really like to um, partner with companies. Um, we've been the first organization that some really successful companies have gotten their start with. Um, and, you know, when possible, we've also worked with organizations where the residents were actually involved with the pilot and helped them refine their offering. Um, it was on an internal kind of communication system um, for the residents. And so them hearing that feedback really made the product much better. Um, I think not just for our community, but for other customers as well. So it's it's a combination, but again, isn't it meeting the need and budget? And um, do we have the people at the table who need to help us decide if this is the right thing or not, the end users? And we had an interesting comment in our pre-call on the concept of framing framing the introduction. Can you give maybe a little insight to the researchers of how you can position and frame things that either will make them more interesting to engage with or less? And because I think that was a very, very strong point. I really liked it. I wanna make sure we share that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think there's a real revolution happening in, in aging services. Um, and I really encourage anybody out there to to understand our field, um, not only what it is right now, but what it can be, um, because technology can help us get there, and to really understand um, the fact that we all have um, often false notions of what it means to be old and what it means to live with dementia. Um, there's a ton of stigma around dementia. There's a lot of stigma around aging. And so if you're working with an innovative um, senior living provider that's you know, done this work and is trying to shift thinking. Um, and maybe you come in and have this really paternalistic view um, of residents um, or this view that aging is all about decline or that, um, you know, everybody, that when you're living with dementia, you can't live a full life. Um, it's gonna turn off some of these um, innovative uh, senior living providers. And we always try to educate people, but I'd say, do the work. Um, there's some great opportunities out there to learn some more things. There's the re, uh, Reframing Aging Initiative, and that is free education, uh, reframingaging.org. Um, and then also, you know, doing some research around what, what are the shifts that are happening with person-directed care and proactive um, wellness and things like that. So good to have Lynn back, Lynn. So we're, <laughs> we're talking about the formal processes, and I posed a question about research and the research value. And a lot of our companies are, are rightfully so very proud of the research and some have patents and copyrights and all kinds of contributions that are intellectual property. Um, how does your culture work in terms of evaluating innovation and, and how does research factor in? Yeah, well, let me say that evidence-based activity is really what's critical. Uh, it's the research that uh, is attendant to our innovation 
has been really critical in our effort to share what we innovate uh, with others. And so I think it's been a, a really meaningful part of things. Um, when we develop a program or work with someone else to develop a program, we wanna understand the value of what we've done, not just the device or the piece of software or what have you, uh, the program, but how it will impact the people we serve. And so uh, that type of research is really important. Now, how do we do that research? We do it in a number of different ways. We have engaged third party uh, objective research organizations to study the work that we've done internally. Uh, we've done pilots for Penn State and Carnegie Mellon um, and uh, have worked with a number of different professionals to help understand the value of their uh, project to the senior population. So I, I, uh, I hope that gives you a bit of what, what uh, we do. It's really important. You need to work with a um, a group that uh, can validate whatever idea it is that, that you're developing, whether it comes from within senior living or outside. That, that was an excellent point. The one reason that I think so is because most people don't realize that a lot of senior living is allocated by licensing. So there's a propensity, unlike most sectors in a capital market, to share. And Lynn's point about validation, if you're going to share something with your uh, professional colleagues, you'd like to have support for what you shared that it works and the transference is really important here. Steve, I'm going to switch topics a little bit. Um, virtual care. We've heard tele everything, telepsych, telemed, tele, 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 and we hear everything's moving to home, right? Uh, one of the slides I had showed sort of the propensity to live at home, not only consumer preference, but, you know, feasibility and economical and whatever. How have you seen the demand from the consumer side for technology and or the use of telehealth? How has that changed your business perspective and, and the, the delivery perspective? Do you see it? Is it just socialization isolation? Is it just clinical, can't get to the physician? How do you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both, uh, John. Um, and I think that, you know, again, it's it's the uh, particularly when you're getting into the VR piece, then then you you know you've got even a uh, I think a higher bar to reach around adoption uh, with folks um, who you know, helping them understand it and how it can really uh, uh, benefit them. And uh, I, I think it's you know I think as we move probably another decade down the road, there's there's going to be quicker adopt adoption to those things. But I think right now there's still some barriers and just a lot of skepticism around it. I think there's you know, one of the things we face most frequently with the folks we work with is that feeling of you're, you know, what are you doing to try to feel like we're trying to monitor them and uh, that people don't you know, feel like big brothers, you know, looking over their shoulder. And so, you know, ways that you can integrate uh, things that that you know diminish that sense of feeling uh, and that concern, uh, and so I think a lot goes back to uh, what you said earlier about how you frame it and how you approach it. Uh, but you know, we what we see is it, it's it's more often the that kind of primary uh, point of contact in their life, usually the adult son or the adult daughter, is very interested in some of those uh, technologies. But but helping mom and dad over that threshold of so it, it, how's it gonna improve their quality of life? Well, how is it gonna help them live their best life? Not, this is a way for us to all monitor them, it, I think is a key in, in the framing of, of everything. Uh, we have seen more interest uh, from our, our uh, the folks we serve here recently though, around getting help, you know, we're using a, a company, you know, kind of a mobile you know, urgent care company come to come to them. Yeah. People have welcomed that idea uh, quite a bit recently uh, because of, I think, a lot of the issues with COVID and getting out of the house. And so actually having somebody come to them and, and using an urgent mobile um, uh, company to come do that is, is something we've seen some folks really take to here recently. And can, I, so, can I add something, John? Absolutely. Man. Yeah, you know, for us, I think option out post-COVID, we're seeing not only adult children, but also older adults um, 
be more open to technology. And so a hybrid approach, which gives people an option, um, I think has gained traction in the last year or so. And I'll give you a, a case in point. We're just rolling, we're piloting um, a piece of software related to an engagement program that we're working on. And we put together a group of um, what we call resident ambassadors. So these are people who are most vocal within the community. We've trained them how to use the software and are using them for an ongoing focus group. They're totally into it. And it's fascinating to watch um, how FOMO is playing a role, fear of, of missing out. And so um, that's interesting. But I, I do wanna say that from our perspective that hybrid option is important, but high tech, high touch, you know, I think that that's really our mantra. Uh, and I know it is for many of my colleagues. We want technology, we want to use it in many different ways, but we want it to facilitate our ability to continue to build relationships. Excellent point. So that's where I was following up, Jill, and I'm going to give you a shot to add on to that. But this idea of personal center design, this idea that uh, technology is built around the user in mind, but that leads to an interesting question uh, that maybe you've seen the infrastructure necessary in these communities to have support for cell phones and Internet of Things and tablets and gaming and clinical stuff and it seems like they're almost becoming, they need their own data centers to run over there. How have you seen the demand and where is the demand going in that field? And, and is the infrastructure important? Because I think a lot of entrepreneurs forget the infrastructure of the community. And then all of a sudden the system may work. There may be research, but it can't scale and it can't meet the needs with the other things going on. Can you comment on that? And then I'll, I'll let the other two also, Steve and Lynn. Well, when you talk about... Um... The technology infrastructure, yes, like that, that all has to be there in order for this to work. And when you're building new buildings, um, hopefully we're all planning our buildings this way, um, but retrofitting communities can be a challenge and it can be costly, um, but it's important as providers that we're doing that. And then there's also the infrastructure of um, people that are needed to support this. Um, and kind of similar to what Lynn was talking about, um, you know, we saw, and this is one of the beliefs about getting older, right? You can't learn new things. Older people don't know technology. Well, last year we saw that that's not true. And we have a lot more people that are embracing things. And in one of the, um, the solutions we implemented, it was a number of years ago, but we, put, we had tablets in all the resident apartment homes. And we were just pulling our hair out because people weren't comfortable with it. And the way it succeeded is we got resident early adopters who were excited about it and they taught everybody else. And they learned that if you don't know how to use a touch screen, you need someone to teach you how to use a touch screen. And they taught on paper before they did the tablets. And so I think there are opportunities. We've got all these people in our communities with amazing gifts um, to, to um, bring out those gifts and people helping each other for that people side of the infrastructure. Uh, Steve or Lynn, do you want to add anything to that? I think that was brilliant what you guys did there, Jill. And you know, and so for us, uh, because we're not in in a, a setting where there's other senior it, seniors, it's really it, it becomes that relationship with that caregiver and and that senior and how you know I think the way you have to think about it in in a home care setting is you know, the caregiver probably being the first person to really adopt and understand and how to use and get them comfortable with it, that's going to help uh, the senior get comfortable with it. So a little different approach, but, but that same idea of having somebody that you trust, you have confidence in that engages with the technology is going to help the senior then come to engage with the technology. And I love what you guys did there, Jill, with uh, having seniors teaching seniors. That, that's brilliant. So I would add only one thing to this, and that is that infrastructure, Wi-Fi infrastructure is, is critical. Without it, you can't really do anything now. But I, I believe a lot of um, what we do in the future will be um, mobile-based, cellular-based. 
And so I, you know, I think we need to prepare for both environments uh, in terms of how we use data and technology. Um, as for adoption, I couldn't agree more. If you can get the people who you want to use the device to actually use it and train others, it's superb. Um, we found that voice activation is really, people like that. And so any device that we can um, move to voice activation, the adoption is, um, is quicker and it's more, it's broader. So I think that that's, uh, that's something we've learned uh, recently as well. So. so it's intuitive to think that we all want to better ourselves and have a betterment of life and wellness and so forth. It's also sort of traditional mindedness in healthcare that um, somebody pays for it. <laughs> we don't pay for it and we get it, whether it be a walker for my hip surgery or medicine and there's a deductible, but I don't really pay for it, right? So. This concept that, uh, again, forward thinkers, Lynn, I know you're leading it, Jill, I know your partner's in it, this idea that you all as providers become risk-based managed care wellness players. In other words, you not only provide the service, but you cover all aspects of keeping somebody well and, and how that extends to life coverage. You know, you care if they go to the hospital or not. It's not just a pass off and back. Always people have cared, but... I don't think people have really had the economic understanding. And I think that's a really new, unique way to look at new partnerships. It's partnerships on the, on the clinical level. It's partnerships on the life, quality life level. It's partnerships with technology. Because now, as organizations, you can invest with quality of life being an outcome, right? As opposed to just transactional. Tell us a little bit about the venture, how you're guiding other people in, in validated ways to sort of manage their own uh, populations and communities in a, in a prudent and very compassionate, effective way. So I think, John, um, we agreed I'd go first on this one and then turn it over to Jill. Jill and I are partners in an operator-owned special needs plan in two states, in uh, Colorado and Ohio right now. We'll see where we go from here. Um, but I, I think the why of um, it's formation is really what's critical here. You know, in senior living, we have always been had 24 seven eyes on people. That's what we do. Right? We monitor people. And I'm not talking about big brother style, but we keep an eye on them. We keep an eye on their condition. We assess them for for needs. Uh, and then we develop care plans. And all of those things have become, um, have come to into the public view as being critical to manage uh, care over a continuum. We've always done it. We've never been paid for it. Frankly, we've never been considered part of the healthcare continuum because chronic care management, preventive oriented care has never really taken its seat at the table. Now um, that's beginning to change. And so for us to be able to show that because we monitor, because we use technology and people to be able to create an environment that not only improves quality of life, but manages chronic illness, uh, it makes sense that we've been able to prove that we can reduce hospitalization well, it make, we needed a way to capture the value of what we've always created. And one of the few places you can do that in this country has been Medicare Advantage, where you, there are some, um, there's some flexibility in what Medicare payment will cover. And so we are able to be paid for some of the work that we do now. And because we're able to, because we own the plan and we set up the contracts with our communities, we also get to share when there are savings. And that's huge. So it's one of the first times we've been able to say, hey, look at us. We're actually doing something of value. And it's, it's preventive. It's about extending quality of life. It's about making people live the life or allowing them to live the life they choose to lead. lead. And by the way, it saves society money. So we'd like to do more of it. So our Medicare Advantage efforts 
have been designed to give us in terms of what we do a seat at the table but also to be able to capture the value we create for the system as a whole. And so that's the reason we started Perennial Consortium and um, its plans in Colorado and Ohio. So Jill, I'll turn it over to you. I cannot add a single thing to that great description, Lynn. Thank you. So, so, the, so the, the interesting thing about that is if you're managing quality and you're not managing transactions, there's room to invest in things that build quality, right? So I Correct. keep telling entrepreneurs that if you go on a transaction type engagement with a community, they're going to say, is it a cost savings or a revenue generator? But if you go to that same community and say, this enhances life, reduces risk, provides clinical quality, that's a different conversation. So in our session last week, we did introduce this concept of ISNIP, DSNIP, um, the idea of uh, providers becoming payers and new partnerships. Um, Steve, in your, in your thinking of partnerships, right, and they may be formal, they may be informal, maybe referral partnerships, you're in the continuum, right? Your father goes to the hospital usually to skilled or assisted to home. Um, what do you, what's your view of partnerships and how is maybe the last couple of years in the career sort of altered where partnerships go as we make this sort of more viable? And maybe how honors sort of rolling up the franchisees internationally and in the US transferred some of that knowledge to the franchise model that allows you to think about that. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's gonna be coming uh, more here in the, the coming months. But, uh, you know, for for me, it, it's it's really about, does it provide value and improve quality of life for the senior? So that that's that's the, you know, the focus for me. And if it it does that, then I'm, I'm open and I've had a, had a couple of conversations here in the last month with a couple of tech providers about some creative ways for us to partner together that really, uh, you know, there's the only win for me in it is it improves the quality of life for the senior. And so if we can do that and, and the technology is going to do that, then I'm interested in, in how, you know, how we, how it gets paid for, uh, how it gets implemented, uh, you know, having more creative, conversations about how to make those things happen and kind of what I've done here since the Thrive Center is here in Louisville you know I've kind of piggybacked on that a little bit and you know work with Sherry on who are who are some of those tech providers that she thinks can can do that in the home care space and using her for an initial intro and then uh, going from there with it. It was kind of funny you say that that you know the idea of the Thrive Center was you always discover a band somewhere and it's a little, it's usually the, the little nook or down the street place you find them, but you see them live. That usually encourages people music. I think the hard part about innovation and aging is in a PowerPoint, you can't transfer too many things live. And so right. when I was the chief innovation officer, I'd see a PowerPoint. I go, I don't know how it works. So I'd want to go see it live. And, and I think that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So when I always say to our portfolio companies, imagine that I have uh Steve, Lynn, and Jill, and we're walking down the floor of Leading Age or ACA or one of the national show, Argentum, and what catches their eye, you know? And I, this is an off, off the beat question. It wasn't sort of in my, in my immediate thinking, but the, I think they probably think, oh, that guy just makes up, you know, interesting things to tell us and whatever. But I did this pre thinking that if I can't tell what you do in a short time, elevator pitch, you know, one-liner value proposition, kind of teeing up our next panel, right? The accelerators and how you how you hone your message in. How do you how do you view when you go to their trade shows, and how what makes you want to stop or what makes you want to? I mean, it, obviously, if it says workforce and it's something interesting, you might stop. But but if you if you're thinking about advice for these early ventures that go to their first shows and they create brochures, they got a nice booth, they're all dressed up, ready for you to come by and you try to make, you know, you make eye contact and then you try to understand what they do. What would your advice be? Because they want to talk to C-level players. Everyone I've talked to, I want to talk to a C-level player. I said, I'll get them on the phone. No, no, I, I want to see him in person, show my stuff. What would your advice be to a researcher entrepreneurial team that would get your attention? The, it, it, it could be marketing advice. It could be elevator pitch advice. It could be how they first come to you and send you an email that, the headline, you know what I'm saying? What would be 
what gets you sort of saying, I, I should take a look at that? Unless somebody else tells you, like if Jill tells Lynn or Lynn tells Steve, I'm sure you're going to look at it. But what, what would be your advice from a marketeering thinking to get your attention as we try to differentiate and seize full of pendants and, and watches? And, you know, we have so many things that are very similar, right? What would you all think? So I'll start. I, you know, for me, um, there are lots of gadgets out there. There are lots of new ideas. Um, what would be important to me is that the entrepreneur understands my business, understands my issues. So if, um, you know, right now workforce is the big thing, but if you can, re you can show that you understand our industry, the needs of the people we serve, uh, the needs of the people who, of all of our stakeholders, I should say, I think that goes uh, a long way. I would suggest every entrepreneur, if you want to be in our world, come live in our world for a week or two. Don't pretend you know it, because until you get in and have to deal with the fact that three people called off, you know, there's a... a Nepalese holiday, which happened two weeks ago at one of my buildings and everybody wanted to be off. You know, you don't know what it's gonna be like on the floor when someone falls, when a family has an issue, when it snows, when it, you know, whatever it is in your area. And it could be a good thing, not necessarily a catastrophe, but understanding our world is important. When you sell, one of the most important things you can do is do discovery. So my advice to an entrepreneur would be do your work, do your homework, do your discovery, and then be prepared to tell a story that relates what you've learned, both from getting into it yourself and in talking to an individual, to the product that you're selling. Connect the dots for us. I, that's perfect. I'm sorry you all had to follow Lynn. Sorry about that. I know. You know <laughs> I want Lynn go last next. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Never follow Lynn Katzman. Um, <laughs> uh, the only thing, you know, the other thing I would um, add is wherever you are located, wherever you're based, all of you out there, it is very likely there's a senior living community somewhere near you or a home care company, whatever it is you're interested in. And reaching out, like Lynn said, and not trying to sell anybody anything, but really to learn what the situation is. Ask if you can spend time there. Try to de developing relationships really, really matters in this field. And you know, our our most long term partners are the ones, and the most successful partners are the ones that understand who we are, what matters to us, what our challenges are, and they continue to make an effort to say now, now what's going on in your organization? What are the ways that we can help you do better? And like during the times of the pandemic, they weren't trying to sell us stuff because that wasn't going to happen. And the pandemic's not over, of course, but they're like, how can we support you? And in doing that, you develop those relationships where things really um, keep going. So everything Lynn said, plus that. I agree. Steve, do you want to add anything? Or you oh, yeah, I got to follow both these uh, smart no, ladies. I, I'm sorry. I gave <laughs> so, you a small order. Sorry. Yeah. About that. No, everything they said is great. Yeah, I you know, found myself not too long ago talking to somebody <laughs> where I spent, you know, 20 minutes explaining what we did. And it was, a, you know, so out of the gate, it was a turnoff that, that he hadn't done his homework. And did, but then he was trying to tell me then how he could fit his technology into what we do. And, it, you know, that was a non-starter for me that I, that I had, you know, yeah, come to me understanding what I do. And then I, the only thing I would add is, is if you can show me right off the bat evidence-based results that particularly right or relate to home care, but even if it would relate to, you know, Christian living communities, that's still going to spike my interest if you show me it's worked somewhere and you've got real data to show me that, particularly if you can show me it's worked somewhere in home care, then, you know, not quite the Jerry Maguire line, you got me at hello, but I'm certainly a lot more interested. <laughs> And, you know, I just saw Rebecca Goodwin put in a comment to volunteer. That's an amazing, uh, amazing um, suggestion to go volunteer in one of the communities nearby. And you'll learn to love 
what we do, right, and know it. And I think that'll really help in development of products and then also communicating with people. Well, you know, it's a it's one of those be careful what you wish for, right? So when I when I ran when I ran the team at Innovate LTC, um, we all became CNAs, and I had this great uh, realization that becoming a CNA was harder than my MBA. <laughs> so, and I wasn't kidding. I mean, there, there's a, there's an aspect of very that. Work. Work. It's very different hard work. And, and so, so that gets me to the purposefulness of this, the, the, the legacy mindedness of this. None of us are innovators in this space just because of the fame or the money or, you know what I'm saying? I came from, I came from a public company that did, you know, digital health, right? Great, great company. This is more, in my opinion, rewarding. And, and, and I have story after story of why and how, but maybe from your perspective, in terms of yourself, your, the, the rewards and the value and the things you get as a leader, share a little bit about your personal insight on why you do what you do, why you value what you do, and how you can translate that as an element of approaching you and engaging with you. I mean, it's an honor for me to listen to you and learn from you, but I know it's all a little deeper than just a job. You know, it might not be a total adventure. It might be a adventure. You, some days you go, wow. But, but tell it a little bit, describe it, what it means to you, I guess, to be an innovator, to be a leader, to be a team, you know, to take care of a resident. You know, they, somebody t- once told me, and maybe this is true, you can really know the value of senior living when you're the family member with a dying resident and you're the member that's there, right? And you're there that day. Um, and that was really powerful, but maybe share your own personal insights as to leader in this space and innovation and what, what the reward is, satisfaction is. It's because it's much more than money, I know. All right, I'm gonna make them follow, I'm gonna make them follow me this time. <laughs> so, you know, for me, it, you know, it hits on two fronts. One, you know, when I was in undergraduate school, I wanted to get, uh, I was gonna, Get a degree in clinical psych, hang a shingle, and do counseling. I went. I had a, a you know, passion to do something to help people, and I took a part-time job as a caregiver while I was finishing up that degree. And and then you know, 30 years later, here I am. But you know, knowing that you really impact somebody's life and and their quality of life, improve their life, um, and so whether that's with the person we serve, whether that's with our caregiver, um, you know. That's the charge I get out of this uh, to this day. And uh, so just, you know, knowing that this is a benefit to the people we serve, to our community. And then I experienced it on the other side when my mother-in-law suffered a debilitating brain aneurysm and my wife and her dad and her sister became her primary caregivers. And then uh, for 18 years, you know, she she needed constant uh, ongoing support. And you know, seeing when she was touched in ways that, you know, took that stress and that load off my wife and off my father-in-law and, and improved her life. You know, when I see that and I, I, I'm a part of that, that's, that's the charge I get. out of. I, I love running a company and, and having a team, but, but at the end of the day that we do something that improves, that helps people live their best life at the end of their life. That's great. And uh, so anything that's going to help people do that, I'm all for it. Perfect. Jill, Lynn? I'll go before Lynn this time. Um, <laughs> so when I, first be, when I first became a nursing home administrator, um, I had the team admit me as a resident just for mm. 24 hours, mm. come up with a diagnosis, treat me like a resident, do everything the way you normally would. You know, and everybody said, you're never going to see what it's really like because you're the boss and they're going to, you know, try to do everything just right. But what I learned is it's not people not doing their jobs that really <coughs> undermine um, quality of life and the institutional model of care. It was the team members doing exactly what they were supposed to do, which was waking me up every two hours to make sure I, I hadn't been incontinent, um, waking me up for skin checks and vital signs, and then waking me up at 5.30 in the morning for breakfast at seven, right? That's how the institutional framework that was set up in a great community. And when I left um, after being, um, after I, they, they discharged me, I hate all these institutional terms and I went home, I cried. And I was so upset that this is what we have done 
to the elders of our world because this is this and again we're doing better but the institutional framework is still there um that i was like we have work to do and we still have work to do and we're getting a lot better um with person directed care and moving things forward but that that drives me is um i'm a little bit of a rabble rouser and i believe that we need to do better and that includes for residential living with folks is not um focusing on people you don't have anything left to give so come and live in our communities and put your feet up. Um, that's not what the research shows we need for a long and healthy life. So how do we really promote citizenship, purpose, continued growth, belonging? Um, so I'm excited about the work that we are doing and how it can not only impact our field, but impact what aging means in our country. Lynn. Yeah, so I, I agree wholeheartedly and I love that you checked yourself in, Jill. What a, what a great story. Um, and great experience. So ageism is the one ism that if we're lucky, all of us will experience. Ageism is the one ism all of us experience. Now, yes, you can say if you're a member of a different ethnic group or religion or live in a different part of the world, you might experience it differently and that's certainly true. But ageism is pervasive. And if you get old enough in America, you will experience it. So my answer is somewhat selfish. I hope that by the time I need that level of support or socialization or choose to make that move, that the world that I enter is one which is vibrant, life-affirming, and enables me to be me so that I'm not just seen as a little old lady who needs a wheelchair and help getting to the bathroom that I'm seen for going to Burning Man, John, and all the <laughs> other cool things that, you know, we do in our lives. And that it, there's a belief I can continue doing that. So for me, it's, um, it's about ageism. It's about changing uh, the way we allow people to age in this country. Um, and uh, I will say one other thing. It, it's also always been about doing well by doing good. And I'm reminded of Margaret Mead and a quote she made. Uh, she, she said, never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has. And that has always driven me. The belief that we, I collectively can make a difference. Well, and it surely makes a difference when we're facing ageism, right? I mean, it, you know, age, sometimes when things are in the distance, but now they're all front and center and they are with our families. So I had one, we have one question from the audience. I'm going to slide in and a final thought. So answer the question or weigh in then final thought. So the, 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 the question is, if you get into a measuring adoption and so you say, we got to measure adoption, you got to, you know, and you're looking at successful adoption, how do you measure it? Is it a formal measure? Is it an informal? Is it a poll of your leadership team? How do you measure it? That was a question from the audience. And then, if you could answer the question and give us a final thought and we'll finish around the horn. So we'll go, uh, Jill, we'll go you first. Since we started with you first, we'll go with you first. Well, for, for uh, resident or elder facing technology, we've always measured it on the percentage of people that are using it daily. And that's what we did with those tablets that I mentioned. Um, I think we went over 95% were using it every day. So it had the, the built in, right? And that's important too is what's within the system so that we can measure how it's being used and if it's successful or not. Um, and then, you know, for things with, that team members are using, it's pretty easy with like an EMR because you have all of the records of who's doing what they need to be doing. Um, but I, I think some of it's also just feedback. Um, and our, you know, what, what are people telling us? And, you know, again, the earlier we get people involved in making the decision about it, the less likely later to have them say, why did you get this? We don't like this at all. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of formal and informal feedback and tracking data. I would agree, totally. Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, adoption is a product of, of usage it's um, a product of that kind of feedback. I would also say it's, um, to me, it, adoption is only one of the measures. The other measure is utility. 
or impact. And, you know, there are many measures of impact depending on your perspective or what, you know, where you're coming from. But I think that that in my mind, I, I look to both of those things. Are people using it? Are they enjoying using it? Are they getting something from it? Is my team getting something from it? Does it save money? Does it make the world a better place? And while that sounds grandiose, you can bring that down to specific KPIs. And I think that um, we do look at that data, but at the end of the day, you need to talk to people as well. And um, you know, my final thought, I, I don't have anything grandiose to say, except I'm thrilled that you're all getting out there with new ideas. Um, the partnership we need to create for successful age tech is, um, is one that includes both those who are on the front lines and those with new ideas um, who come from outside our industry. And bringing together the two, I think, will yield the most vibrant opportunities for growth and innovation in the future. Steve, you want to finish this up or did you already talk when I dropped off? Uh, no, I'll, just a quick comment. I you know, echo what the lady said. You know, it, it, we also look at the percentage of people using it. That, that's uh, the metric along with, uh, I, I just put it in this context, the power of story. I hear a great story of how it changed somebody's life, improved their life, and uh, then then that tells me that that it's it's worthwhile. So uh, the the uh, dashboard metric combined with the story uh, is what I'm looking for. And your final thought? You know, uh, this was great for me. I, I learned a couple of things uh, through this, and just even articulating some of this helped frame uh, for me a little bit how I want to think about things going forward. So uh, I hope the the people listening got something out of it. If they but if they didn't, I can say I did. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. So on behalf of all my colleagues at NIH and specifically my teammates at the National Institute on Aging, um, I'm signing off this panel. It was great to have you. I appreciate you all taking the invitation and uh, sharing your inspirational thoughts. And I'm going to turn it back to Monique, who's going to introduce my good friend, uh, Mary Furlong, to take us through the next chapter of the day. And uh, it's, I'm a blessed to uh, be able to enjoy doing this and be engaged with each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. And we're seeing some great feedback. Thank you, Steve Hendricks and Jill and Natalia Awesome and Lynn Katzman. And, and thank you, John, for moderating. Uh, we're so excited that you joined us today. Such great nuggets of wisdom. Uh, I do want to uh, note that this is just uh, session one. We have two more sessions going on for you. So I hope you'll stick with us. For those who may be joining anew, uh, I just wanted to ground you and where we are. This is the Developing and Accelerating Age Tech and Digital Health Solutions. You'll be hearing some perspectives and insights from C-suite leaders. And as we go into our next session, we'll be focusing on, on our accelerators panel. And now for this next session, we have some great experts with us today. I'd like to welcome Rick Robinson. He's the Vice President and Product and Startup Engagement at AARP Innovation Labs. We also have Mary Haynes. Uh, she is the President and CEO of Nazareth Home. And she's also the Vice Chairman of Board Thrive Center, Inc. We're also joined by Keith Cammy, the Managing Director of Techstars Future Longevity Accelerator, and Mary Furlong, who's gonna be our esteemed moderator today. Thank you, Dr. Furlong. She's a CEO of Mary Furlong and Associates and board member of Thrive Center Inc. And with that, I will just say a couple quick things. Please do feel free to uh, uh, fill out and send us some questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to do that. Uh, we are recording this session. We've gotten that question a few times. We will share the recording as soon as it's available. We have to make it five-way compliant and we'll post it on our website. And please do fill out our feedback form and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. We'll include those links as well. With that, Mary, I would like to turn it over to you. Wow, that was a wonderful session. Um, so learned a lot there. And one of the things I learned is, you know, work with people like Jill and Lynn and, and this team because they can help you shape your idea. Um, I am Mary Furlong. I've been building companies in the longevity market for about 30 years. And I have a marketplace consulting firm 
that works with entrepreneurs and investors and brokers introductions. I also produce an events like the Washington Innovation Summit coming up and work with John for many years and the group at the Thrive Center. But today we're going to be looking at technology accelerators and we are joined by three amazing industry leaders who all support, mentor and help grow companies in the longevity marketplace. Um, so I'm Rick Robinson, Mary Haynes and Keith Kamai. So first we're going to turn to our panelists and ask them to introduce themselves and mm -hmm. Tell us their organization and role and how they help startups in this space. So let's start with you, Rick. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, hi, I'm Rick Robinson. Um, I head of product and innovation for AARP's Innovation Lab, where we work with a lot of startups uh, throughout the year. And I'll get into a little more detail in a minute, but it's uh, essentially a, a cohort model where we bring companies in uh, virtually now, and um, we do everything we can with these early stage companies to get them best prepared to deliver their product or service to the 50 plus market and to those who support that market. So uh, that's what we do in a nutshell. Uh, thank you for having me. And Mary. Might be on mute, Mary. And we have Mary Haynes. Yeah, sorry about that. Mary Haynes here in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm president of Nazareth Homes. We have uh, two continuing care retirement communities. We're faith-based, uh, considered small in the large scheme of things. So what we have done is help be a start to a group called the Innovators Alliance. We participated in that group for a number of years. We'll talk later about the development of the Thrive Center as a part of that alliance. But for us, knowing that technology is essential for us to sustain any organization and being small, we wanted to align ourselves with other like-minded thought leaders who, for shared learning and for investment. So we uh, lessen our time spent, we increase the value of that time, and we don't make as many mistakes. In the previous panel, we heard somebody say you're bombarded. And that is the condition, of course, when you're a provider, we're bombarded by a lot of smart, smart with great products, but the space is pretty crowded. So we wanna find a way to uh, move through that and then help the ones who we do see have a great user ability in our space, get them to distribution. And I, I certainly remember that, um, Mary, because I've watched you do that time and time again, helping with pricing models and, and go-to-market strategies. So over to you, Keith. Yeah, so the headline is, um, name is Keith Kamai. I'm the Managing Director of the Techstars Future of Longevity Accelerator. Um, I run this program in partnership with uh, uh, Pivotal Ventures, which is an innovation and incubation company developed by Melinda French Gates. Uh, and they're, they're focused on uh, moving forward innovation in areas where progress is stalled. And certainly caregiving is uh, one such area where we're needing to make a lot more progress. And um, we're focused on solutions that um, uh, help, help meet the needs of both the uh, older adult and the uh, more importantly, and most importantly, the, the family caregiver, the unpaid family caregiver whose uh, lives are often disrupted um, by helping them. And so our solutions are in half a dozen different themes. I can get to more depth on, um, but that, that it, it's all about uh, helping alleviate um, uh, some of that burden and aging with more dignity. So I suggested that the panelists provide a few slides to describe more in depth what they do. So we're going to start with Rick. Great. And I'll, I'll move to these quickly, not to bore you, uh, particularly not with my picture. <laughs> we could jump to the next slide. Uh, so the Innovation Lab, I covered this briefly, but we, we essentially aspire to become the recognized leader in HTech, fostering products and services that empower people to choose how they live as they age. Next slide, please. 
So what is age tech? There's a lot of different definitions. We kind of identify it as, um, first of all, thinking of it as this $8.3 trillion economy that is the spending power uh, and money that's, that's spent uh, among 50 plus. Uh, so we're, we think of age tech as uh, sitting at the intersection of longevity and technology. Uh, age tech includes products and services and experiences across industries that contribute to longer, healthier lives. Next slide, please. Yeah, I mentioned uh, the uh, the big number, 8.3 trillion, growing. With, uh, our es estimates are to 28 trillion uh, by 2050. This is a huge space um, with a, <laughs> a lot of opportunity, particularly for startups and for investors. And a lot of investors don't really grok it yet, so we're doing the work to try to get people to understand that there's a really strong uh, desire here among the 50 plus and those who are kind of aging into 50 plus who want modern um, products and services delivered to them, not the kind of things that have been marketed to them um, for years. Um, so we are, we are here to try to push those forward. If you could move to the next slide maybe. So what do we do? We discover startups. We help them scale, um, and then we foster a human-centered approach, both with our with our companies, our startups, and in our portfolio, and also we do work with AARP uh, in general. Uh, next slide, please. So, how do we do it? Um, we run pitch competitions and uh, challenges all throughout the year. Pre-COVID, they were in person. Um, now they're all virtual. And uh, that's a great way for us to source early stage companies. And then we're able to select the ones we'd like to work with. And if they'd like to work with us, um, we uh, bring them into our accelerator program, uh, which I think I talked about in the next slide. Yeah, so when companies come into our accelerator program, we kind of come at them with a uh, kind of a warm blanket, a uh, cloak, if you will. Uh, at the very uh, front end, we talk to all of them about what is it that you feel like you need most? Um, is, it, is it research? Is it understanding the market better? Is it support on the UX that you're trying to, of your product that you're trying to communicate to our audience? And we've got business leads, we've got UX folks, we've got marketers on the team that are assigned directly to each of the startups. So it's a very high touch experience and they work very closely with the startups for a period of eight weeks to, as you can see, mentor, co-create, collaborate. Um, and then at the end of the eight weeks, um, we kind of send them out into, into the world, a much better, much more prepared uh, company with a more uh, uh, potent product. And then of course, we also uh, invest in these companies and most of the companies um, so that's a, that's a benefit for being part of the program as well. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a, a sampling of some of the companies we've got in our portfolio. By the end of the year, we'll probably have around 60 or so. Um, and these generally fall into, uh, you know, health tech, fintech, and other social areas. But we've got gaming. We've got uh, a whole, whole slew of areas that we're, we're focused on. Um, so uh, I think that's all I've got to talk about what we're doing here. Yeah. It's, it's very impressive, Rick. And I know you came out of AOL, so you understand about rapid cycle uh, yeah. innovation. And uh, so you're yeah. helping them to not only help build the product, but refine it as you learn, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, throughout my career, I've been kind of um, product and content um, and often in a kind of leading edge, uh, you might say, innovation space. And that is very quickly and iteratively putting out uh, new ideas and, and testing them and, and killing most of them because uh, you discover they're not going to go anywhere. Um, and so we try to help um, our startups who aren't as versed in that to be able to embrace that practice um, and, 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 you know, uh, just help them along the way uh, in, in a variety of things. It can be just a phone call on a Tuesday night when a founder is kind of like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you know, it, there's, so there's a bit of that and there's a lot of practical hands-on 
um, support that we give. And then of course the backing of AARP's uh, research and knowledge and so on can be uh, extremely helpful, yeah. Right, I don't think I've seen a business plan that doesn't say, and then I'll partner with AARP. So how great to have <laughs> innovation labs there to help learn how to navigate that. So let's turn to Mary. And Mary, I've known you a long time and I've watched you meet an entrepreneur and know immediately that that idea would be having traction. Uh, I'm specifically thinking of PayActive, but tell us a little bit about how you work with startups. There, thank you. I think I have some slides here. If you'll go to, um, I do want to talk uh, about the Thrive Center. So as we said, as we talked about uh, those of us on the provider side, some of us like to team up together for that thought leadership and shared learning. And several of us did that, five of us did that about four years ago. And now four years later, there's 13 uh, provider organizations. And what we have, of course, to offer to these smart entrepreneurs who are interested in the longevity space is understanding our workflow, uh, feedback on pricing, the user interface, how things will actually be received, the pay for. Uh, so many of the products, gee, we'd love to have them on board, but how is that going to fit into our current structure and who's going to pay for it? So uh, the Thrive Center was born out of this desire to really have a playground where uh, the, the entrepreneur could come together with the mentor, where that you could get real pilots and, and feedback from, from the users. One of the things about, um, you mentioned Keith, the caregiver, uh, there's professional caregivers, of course, in much of the senior space. And with the workforce issues, what we try to sift through in these products, as great as they might be, is really how will they fit? And I think that's where we found the, the value of providers being engaged uh, with, with the entrepreneur. So let's go to the next slide. So here you'll see these Thrive Alliance providers. We're all over the country. We're large and small. We're from Minneapolis to Texas to California. Um, and, and we are like-minded in our desire to have our ministries, our mission, we're largely a nonprofit and our desire to have the absolute best for the people who live, work and play in our communities. Next slide, please. So solving challenges and scaling solutions, our executive director, Sherry Rose came up with this tagline because that's, that's really what it's all about. Those challenges are there and how can we work together uh, to find some solutions that can be scaled. And if it works for me in Louisville, Kentucky with the team that I have, it might work in California, but you know, there's a lot of flyover land here. So let's figure out what's gonna work for everybody large and small. And we think that's a real value that we bring. So the innovation entrepreneurship is one of our pillars, the research and education, hooking people up with investors. We do not take uh, uh, percentages of companies, but we like to hook them up to people who will do that. And, and then of course, what we can truly bring is that distribution to be able, if they are scalable. So for position in the center, the center is actually a physical split place. Uh, we have uh, research in there, we have students in there, a lot of what I would loosely call therapy uh, interventions are positioned in the center. There's a lot of groups who use that, but a lot of um, proof of concept and a lot of um, master's prepared students and doctoral students who are conducting their research. So the next slide. You'll see we have the ARP Innovation Labs. They're a collaborative partner. We are uh, really value that relationship that we have with the Innovation Lab. Uh, Mary Furlong and Associates. Um, 
So, and, and certainly CDW, and we'll be announcing soon uh, uh, an agreement that we have with CABI out of Canada. Um, we have been appreciating our relationship with them for about two years now. So just for example, I'll, I'll give you an example of a company that, um, as we said, so many people are looking at our space. So there was a smart entrepreneur that uh, we met a couple of three years ago at uh, a summit uh, that Mary held. She had a technology product for a life story. So if you're familiar and, and you've ever been in kind of organized uh, congregate living, the life story becomes a very important vehicle for person-centeredness, the thing that everybody fears about coming into our space, being invisible. So the production of that life story as a vehicle to uh, describe an individual becomes important. So there's a lot of them. The space is very crowded. This uh, entrepreneur, she was very persistent. She uh, attached onto us and we have uh, helped her through the path of her company uh, where there's a lot of people doing what she does, but she is a great listener. So we did a pilot for her here, several other people, and we worked with her really around, um, as, as Mary said earlier, about the pricing. So that pay for uh, becomes very val a valuable um, a support that we can give to an entrepreneur to help them how to fit in the workflow, how to capture their own story. We were able to um, uh, direct her in that area. She has, has some tab of money and now she is off and, and on her way and really has a product that's ready for uh, distribution. So that, that's an example of how we can, uh, can work with companies. I may have one more slide. No, that's it. Mary, that's really helpful because we see that in some of the NIA funded companies, they may come out of research institutions, but getting this validation in the field is really important. And then conversely, there are companies that have been out in the field growing the business, but don't have the evidence-based research institution. So in some ways, a lot of that comes together in Louisville because you also work with higher ed institutions. Right, We've done, we're doing several CAPS uh, projects. And again, I think that the, uh, you know, trying to um, continue to stay active as we age is so important. So it's, it's always that there's a number of products that encourage and support mobility and prevent falls. That's a lot of the capstone work uh, that we do with, with entrepreneurs and try to help them understand how that really can work and also how it can scale, not be so expensive and have validation. And of course, I love hearing that the CABI Thrive relationship is coming together. We are still in the early innings in the longevity marketplace. So hearing what each other's doing can move this a lot faster. So thank you, Mary. That's great and amazing work you all do there. Uh, let's turn to Keith now. And Keith, tell us a little bit what you did before as the Dean uh, of Entrepreneurs with Techstars. Terrific, thanks, uh, th thanks Mary, and, and thanks for having me. This is, uh, this is fabulous to get uh, such a spotlight on the category. Um, as I said, uh, and I'll, I'll fill in the backstory, but I'm, I'm currently the um, Managing Director of the Techstars Future of Longevity Accelerator run in partnership with Pivotal Ventures, uh, which is a fabulous partner that I'm delighted is uh, throwing their hat in the ring on supporting the category. Um, we, with uh, Again, that's Melinda French Gates' fund. And um, pr prior to jumping into this particular program, I was actually uh, running the worldwide accelerator footprint for all of Techstars. So I was overseeing our 50 some odd programs around the world um, for the last few years. And uh, when, when this opportunity came along to jump into the category with a partner like that um, and a, a category that I'm passionate about at many levels, both experiencing 
being a uh, caregiver, <laughs> family caregiver in the family, my, my wife and I, and also having uh, created a startup before that was serving older adults in the fitness tech space. Um, it was uh, uh, too good to pass up. So I uh, left the dean's office for the classroom and, uh, and, and had the pleasure of working with entrepreneurs focused on this particular problem. Um, and, and so we are focused on innovative solutions that address the unmet needs of older adults and their caregivers, like I said before, and that's in half a dozen different sub-themes, um, aging in place, care coordination, caregiver support, financial wellness, preventive health, and social engagement. Um, every company that comes in touches one or more of those things directly or indirectly, and we're looking to collectively you know, chip away at moving the needle on the massive uh, category and, and unmet needs. Um, I'll spin quickly through Techstars overall to give you a little grounding on what we do generally and then jump in specifically to why this particular category uh, became one of our 50 programs. Um, and, and so the, the backstory on Techstars, if you don't know, is that it started um, 15 years ago or so as an experiment in Boulder, Colorado, when uh, 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 founders and venture capitalists got together, uh, including Brad Feld and David Cohen, and um, felt that there was a better way to support early stage startups through uh, mentorship, uh, as opposed to the semi-brutal way that it was uh, mostly being done with angel funding that was not particularly uh, angelic, we'll say. And um, they, they found that if they, the, the experiment was, can we get you know, 100 of our closest friends together to mentor these companies who've been through the drill before, whether it's subject matter experts or entrepreneurs themselves, to help see around corners. You know, I've seen this movie before, I know how it ends is kind of the theme on a lot of startups and that's what mentorship looks like. And uh, maybe through curated mentorship, uh, we can help entrepreneurs avoid some of the common pitfalls uh, th that we've all faced before and uh, chart a faster, better path to um, potential success because there are so many more ways to fail than succeed as a startup. But if we can increase the odds, um, we, we can help people uh, uh, you know, get, get to the success that'll have an impact. That experiment worked, uh, and now there are 50 programs around the world serving about 500 entrepreneurs a year. Um, you know, thousands of graduated startups, um, many thousands of mentors. Uh, over 17 billion dollars of funding has gone into these companies collectively over the years. We love that stat because it says not only that we love these companies, but other investors are voting with their wallet to say that they do too. Um, the market cap of those companies is actually higher than this now, um, but uh, $71 billion as of this writing. And then there are 16 unicorns out of the classes to date. Um, and then generally, again, on Techstars generically, I'm often asked, what does it take to get into a program? And we're very transparent about our decision criteria. It's uh, the first three criteria at a six or team, team, team. So we feel that early stage, it's all about the entrepreneurs and the prospective entrepreneurs and are they, do they have a big vision? Are they quick executors? Do they, you know, kind of have what it takes to be um, uh, successful in the, in the hard journey of being an entrepreneur? Um, and then uh, market, uh, mar market meaning the problem that they're trying to solve as opposed to their solution, because we find that smart people working on really big problems will pivot their way towards something successful at these early stages. Um, and it's, you know, while idea is on the list, your solution is on the list, it's last out of six, not because it's unimportant, but because we know it can change um, in, in these early stages uh, through pivoting um, and, and mentorship. Um, and then finally, uh, the progress or traction uh, validating that uh, someone thinks it's a good idea <laughs> in addition to yourself. Um, so, so that's Techstars uh, um, overall. I, I think I have a few quick slides, which I'll just hit really quickly. The, the headlines are, you know, what do we do in a program? We take 10 companies into an accelerator once a year. Um, and they, these are running at all different times around the world. So, so any given program is 10 companies a year. Um, we just kicked off our class yesterday, in fact. So I'm taking a quick break from supporting my class to come be here with you. And I'm, I'm happy uh, that, that we've got a great group and, and I'm delighted that other people are focused on the category. We're gonna take them through an intensive three-month boot camp uh, of uh, mentorship. And then um, uh, you know, with, with the overall goal of making two years of progress in 13 weeks. And that's both by mistake avoidance and just um, getting a lot of people in the right room to help them. Um, programming by month. The first month, uh, we you know, kind of break it down, meaning we're going to get them to talk to 100 different mentors <laughs> and get mentor whiplash with a lot of feedback. Some of it will be on track, some will be off track, a lot of feedback that they ultimately have to get together and say, hey, do we, you know, where are we going to pivot based on this? Is this helping me see things, maybe a new market channel, a new idea, something that 
you know, might be a dead end that I thought I was working on. I can tell you from my own experience doing a couple startups before, including a, a venture back startup, um, I would have saved two years by having gone through an accelerator before pivoting to my eventual market segment. Um, next, once they have some uh, more clarity, they're going to focus on build, build, build. So execution, growth, get some traction on whatever uh, they're focused in on. And ultimately, uh, in month three, uh, we're, we're focused kind of on the storytelling. How do you bring others along with your journey? Vitally important as a uh, founder to be able to storytell concisely and clearly about what you're doing. It came up in the last panel, too. But, you know, you got to be able to um, explain your idea as well to bring others along your journey, whether that's staff, investors, partners, um, customers. And so we're heavily focused on that in, in month three going out to market. Um, and then under the covers or behind the scenes for any given accelerator is the worldwide network. So this is the part that didn't exist 15 years ago in Boulder. Uh, so any given program stands alone as an accelerator, but behind the scenes, there's this massive network of, of worldwide connectivity to the entrepreneurial ecosystem, not just for the, any, the, you know, the category we're focused on in this program, but for all our programs collectively. And that's a, uh, 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 we say tech stars for life when we really mean it, every entrepreneur is connected to this network. Um, of uh, mentors and partners and investors and community programming that's um, a long-term asset for them. Uh, you can move on to the next one. Uh, okay, so with that context, um, just a few quick stats on why longevity? Why did we add a program in this category and, and why did Pivotal Ventures come along and fund it? And, and why did I uh, leave my otherwise uh, prestigious title of worldwide uh, oversight to come into one particular program? And it, you know, the, the, the numbers uh, say a lot here, um, including that uh, uh, you know, uh, 10,000 people in the US are turning 65 every day. I uh, uh, love this stat from uh, our friends at AARP that 90% of uh, folks over uh, 65 want to age in place and the infrastructure isn't effective for that today. So a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities to solve problems out there. Um, one in five Americans will be over 65 by 2030 and 50% of babies born in 2007 will live to 104, says at least one uh, thought leader. So uh, the problem is not uh, well, the opportunity is not getting smaller. Uh, and then why caregiving is a focus within that. Um, again, from AARP, there are 53 million unpaid caregivers in the U.S. That includes both child care and senior care, but most of it is senior care. 80% um, of uh, 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 senior care uh, home is provided, uh, home senior care is provided by unpaid caregivers, such as my uh, wife and me are one of those data points. And it's, uh, you know, that our infrastructure is uh, not set for it well. Uh, two thirds of unpaid caregivers are women, which is part of why uh, the Pivotal Ventures Group is so focused on this. They're, they're very focused on gender equality and career disruption. And COVID has made that even worse. Um, most of the job loss has been um, born by uh, the oldest daughters uh, in the family, as, you, as many of you may know, and, um, uh, and on average 20 hours per week uh, by, is spent by caregivers providing unpaid care. And I think I have one more um, slide. Oh, and then the, the, the spending power is just enormous. I won't go through um, each of these, but uh, well, I'll just headline out 56% uh, of dollars spent are by someone over 50. So why not focus on this market? It's amazing. You know, and, and by the way, so sidetrack here, you know, old, you know, founders solve the problems they see. The stereotypical founder uh, is the, well, I won't denigrate the hoodie because I got one on right now, but is the hoodie wearing young male, right? That's not the founders we're supporting in our program. That nothing, you know, nothing wrong with that. We'd love founders to come in with that, but the people experiencing this, um, these challenges are, are not the traditional founders of startups that Silicon Valley is always funded. Um, and, and so uh, uh, it's a massive market opportunity that is often overlooked by traditional venture and that's only uh, gonna, gonna grow in opportunity um, and and, and uh, the, the entrepreneurs we're supporting are um, universally uh, older than average and more experienced. And we think that's a huge asset. Um, most wealth is uh, controlled by baby boomers. Um, our partner Pivotal put out a report. You can uh, see it online. It's uh, called, uh, at investin.care. They did this with McKinsey and the holding company and others involved and basically sized out the care economy just to validate if, you, if you've got a 
solution in the category and need stats to grab to, for your slot deck, there's a lot of them in there, and it, including original research to, to scope out whether this is a good problem to focus on. And um, uh, there, there are a lot of people in the, in the market. So I think that's all I had, but that, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's why we're focused here. And we think it's a great opportunity for uh, probably preaching to the choir here for everyone involved in the category. So Keith, I can't say enough about that, uh, that large database of contacts that you have. And an entrepreneur might hear that, but really it's learning how to leverage that. That's so important. I think United Healthcare sponsors of Techstars in Minneapolis, right? And if you have that Rolodex, that can do a lot to advance your business because you really could go anywhere in the world to have a connection, right? Exactly. So, so we consider uh, mentorship to be the secret sauce. And so there's direct mentorship in any given program. And then there's the connectivity to the rest of the world. And, and it's, um, as you said, I mean, we have, uh, um, you know, dozens and dozens of direct corporate partners who are, are involved in our programs. And so you can get direct access to them. But then, you know, frankly, uh, whatever door we knock in, we, we find uh, interested people in hearing about companies that are um, being supported by tech stars and pivotal ventures together. So, so um, uh, yeah, the, the the ability to connect the network is a is a I'd say one of our superpowers um, that creates a lot of value in a condensed period of time. And so, one of the joys of my work, I'm going to pull up a few slides to share, is seeing the orchestra of talent of people coming into the space. And um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm I've started three companies, SeniorNet in 1996 looking at older adults and technology at Third Age, which Melinda was an advisor to us, a brand advisor. So great to see her participation here. And then MFA, which is, I think we're going into our 20th year and also working with ARP for 20 years. So very exciting. Out of all of this, we created a slide, which hopefully you have, um, let's to look at the longevity ecosystem. So I'm a professor, so I just have a few slides to show you um, that provide an overview and then we'll go to open questions. So start thinking about your questions and let's turn to the next slide. And so in this ecosystem, you've got nonprofits, associations, federal and state government, and we're having our Washington conference in a couple of weeks and the amount of funding coming in to aging in place initiatives is in the billions in the new economy. So it's really worth looking at. And then more and more investors, corporations, as Keith just described. So let's turn to the next slide. And I pulled out a few of the accelerators and incubators and the associations. I mean, through ARP reaches 38 million people, N4A, the National Area Agencies on Aging, which has a new name called US Aging, a lot of the government money is going into those area agencies on aging. And we need to follow that. Uh, of course, Mary talked about Thrive. Then on the state and federal government level, we have um, NIA and Todd has just done an amazing job since he arrived and bouquets to him for hiring a great team, including John and Joy and others. And then corporations and these corporations from Homestead, which was recently acquired by Honor to Best Buy Health, um, which acquired Great Call to Ziegler and Linkage, um, these are really important groups. Now, I've been an advisor to the Ziegler Linkage Group for about eight years, and they're now on to their third fund to fund in this space. Um, gosh, I can't see my last column. It must be the entrepreneurs, but many of the entrepreneurial companies that are, that are here, and of course, we work with a lot of them from, um, we started with Caring.com and CareLinks, both of which were acquired, and then iClick and iGuard and um, many others. So let's turn to the next uh, slide. Some of the investors and entrepreneurs in the market. And uh, Keith is right about the entrepreneurs. A lot of these caregiving issues hit midlife. And so Primetime Partners is not only funding 
young entrepreneurs, but also midlife entrepreneurs who also have a Rolodex of experience and relationships. So some of the ones we work with include uh, Health Tech Angels, then in Chicago, Seven Wire Ventures, in um, Vista Equity Partners, which just took a stake in IN2L. On the corporate side, we're seeing more corporations have an innovation investment arm like Nationwide Ventures or Common Spirit Health. Um, and then in the venture side, we have Flare Capital, Elevate Capital, and then more entrepreneurs that you can see. So we are tracking the deal flow and that's in our newsletter each month. And also who is beginning to have an investment thesis around this. And I think Rick has some news to share about that too. So let's turn to the last slide. Um, more investors at the seed level. This is the hardest place to find funding. So, you know, bouquets to both. Uh, tech stars and to um, ARP Innovation Labs for providing some of that early capital. TIDE is the uh, Indian Entrepreneur Association. Um, one of our friends there, Anu Shukla, just sold a second company for 400 million. And so she's willing to help companies look at TIE. Cowboy Ventures, Eileen Lee, uh, who coined the term, um, Unicorn has just funded um, Get Set Up. Um, Define Ventures, Lynn Chow O'Keefe, very important in this space. Um, Wave Maker 360 in Pasadena, another player. And then on the corporate level, we see Home Instead, J and J, Sodexo, Stanley. And then globally, we have more and more uh, social impact funds and global funds investing in here. And then social impact, um, ARP, CABI, SCAN. And I think we're gonna see more funding for social impact. We recently met an investor from Norway who had uh, invested in a company called No Isolation. So what's exciting about this puzzle of the longevity market, there's new players coming in all the time and really there's an orchestra of talent. So I like to say that the longevity market today is where the internet market was 30 years ago, but we have so much ahead of us in terms of problems and solutions. So it's good we're all collaborating together. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to you, Rick, and tell us what's next if you can. Classic uh, mute mistake. Uh, so we are working on something I actually can't talk uh, in detail about till next week, but we're, we're looking at um, uh, doing something that AARP has always done quite well, which is convening uh, people and organizations and so on. So in the age tech space, um, we're looking at doing something very ambitious in that area. And uh, I'll be able to talk about it next week. Uh, and hopefully you won't have to hear from me, you'll hear it from uh, media outlets. So I apologize for the tease, but stay tuned. And of course, also we'll see you at CES in January and we'll be covering things at JP Morgan Healthcare in January too. Yeah. Um, so now Keith, can you tell us the names of the companies that you met yesterday? Is that public yet? It is public as of yesterday. No, I'm delighted. I'm delighted with this. And uh, you can uh, get, get, I should have had a slide with their logos. I have not come adequately prepared for that to promote my class, but uh, there's a release on our, our website uh, or our um, uh, LinkedIn page. But the uh, I'll, I'll give you the qu uh, quick thumbnail of 10 companies, one, one, one phrase each. So Abby is Affordable Advanced Electric Vehicles for Personal Mobility. Very cool uh, company. Uh, Better Co-Living is a single family home co-living solutions for companionship and financial security. Bright is bringing scientific research on brain health to market, starting with 40 Hertz light therapy. Um, health Hive is care coordination um, for paid and unpaid, uh, for paid family uh, care, sorry, for, uh, oh yeah, Health Hive is connecting paid and unpaid family caregivers together after discharge. So it's care coordination platform. 
Uh, my fit pod is a business in a box for independent fitness professionals focused on older adults um, who tend to uh, like to have their local trainer supporting them. So they, the uh, trainer can go online now with business in a box. Andy Care is the platform for in-home dependent care and coordination. Sadon is uh, unbiased uh, uh, data and information for navigating Medicare plan selection under Ask Claire. Uh, you can see their platform online under that name. Um, Alera is a care concierge platform um, uh, so that when you're spending uh, time with your loved one, it is uh, not on frustrating administrative tasks uh, that can be farmed out to a care concierge, but on um, uh, being together. Wave is smart cushioning technology to prevent bed sores. And then um, finally, Vivo are live interactive classes focused on strength and wellness and, and cognitive training for older adults. And um, an, an amazing company, and I'm putting in an extra long plug because they have an NIA grant pending. And so I'm, uh, you know, hoping Todd is listening and uh, they, they, they got an amazing uh, uh, platform um, for uh, helping uh, seniors age uh, well. So let's turn to Mary. What do you think about those ideas? How many of those are relevant to the people you serve? <laughs> oh, wow. What a question. Well, certainly last one. I, I think movement and cognition are so um, important and they're also accessible. So when we start thinking about how to support a person in use of that technology, the user interface seems to be a bit more intuitive and uh, I, I, I like that. Um, I, I want to say something about what, what was said earlier about story and um, that Someone very smart says, what you cannot articulate, you cannot change. And so when we're talking and if those entrepreneurs are listening, I think what's been said here and on that earlier panel, it's so important is to collect that story and to make that personal and to have that um, ability to talk about why you, you know, so so it's those answers. Okay, so what? Then what? Then then how come? And uh, I think that's important mentorship and and advice and and to not get lost in the technicalities, but to be able to step back and make that uh, important to a sense of well being. I still remember the rainy day. I went to the top of Black Rock in New York, and I had five minutes to pitch. Uh, for $50 million. And I think, <laughs> and it was a really make it or break it kind of time. And so we could tell the story about social isolation and the use of technology as we were getting funding for Third Age. And you know, you could walk on air when you finish because you've got the story right. But getting the story right and getting the business model right are really separate things. Yes. And this is a complicated market. It involves reimbursement, it involves payments, it involves home care and senior housing. So can we talk about the different channels that you help people find as they enter the market? Open it up to any of the panelists. I think the pay for is so important. We recently, Sherry, uh, Drive Center was coaching uh, an individual that found her. This entrepreneur said, well, I want to work with uh, the CCRCs because they have all the money. You know, we don't have all the money. We are a charging operation. So how how what how what is going to be used fits already into both the workflow, the things we provide, and and affordable for the consumers. Uh, that's what really matters. The same at home. Um, you know, Mary mentioned uh, PayActive. PayActive is a product that allows workers to draw down their worked yet unpaid income. And in the, in the learning about the importance of that, the New York Times was producing some material that said the average American cannot write a check greater than $400 for an unpaid expense. So um, pay for is very, very important, regardless if, if we're at home or in a congregate living center. 
as we look out at those numbers that Keith shared on, on how the population is growing, we have to always be mindful of what, what is their ability to write a check. And if they can't write the check, who's going to write it? That's right. I think I still remember Dan Herman looking to you for validation on his investment thesis. And he thanks you to this day because that's been one of the most successful companies in their portfolio. So um, another thing I see, another common mistake is over-engineering a product. So inside the ARP Innovation Lab or uh, with Techstars, how do you help avoid people that just keep adding functions to the product when in fact a simpler user interface design may work better? Well, I, I would say that I would repeat, repeat a cliche that you probably all heard, and that is if the first version of your product uh, is not embarrassing, then you've done it wrong. Um, and the point there is, of course, to very rapidly get uh, a product out that consumers can respond to. Uh, and that could be something as simple as, uh, as something on paper. Um, or today, it's so easy. The tools are there to make it very easy to create a prototype of your idea to get feedback on. And then, of course, you iterate and you, you put that feedback back into your, your product. And you, know, you should be able to get something up and out the door in front of people that they can interact with in, in a matter of, frankly, in a matter of days in some cases. Um, so we, we encourage um, entrepreneurs to try to work very quickly like that and iteratively like that um, and, and get that feedback um, on a regular, regular cadence. Yeah, and, and, and uh, same, same, same here. And, and to, to underscore that for anyone listening, the, the asset you have as a, as a startup is speed. Um, and, and you've got to use that asset to your advantage, especially if you're going against a large incumbent player. What you have is the ability to uh, watch users in the day, write a new version overnight, get your next set of feedback the next day. And the bureaucracy is you and whoever's sitting around the table, you can make a decision among yourselves and, and move on. And, you know, in, in, you know, three months time, that's, that's the opportunity for 90 iterations of your product. I, you know, I know the textbook says take a week or two on your sprint. How about every 24 hours? Um, and what you can do is then move quicker while the bureaucratic company has to present it to multiple departments internally and do their postmortems on why this one didn't work. And, and so while they can throw infinite resources at it, you can throw your ability to be nimble at it and, and move quickly. Um, and so that, that's, uh, uh, that, that underlies the, the methodology of moving quickly and being disruptive. And then um, we, we add to that uh, a whole lot of mentorship in the category. So people are looking at the meta patterns of what you're thinking about. And back to your previous question on market channels, there are so many options for how to go to market in any given uh, product or solution. And your, your first impulse or the first customer that comes across um, might sound really compelling because, oh, I've got a customer, let me go after that. Well, you might want to step back a second and say like, all right, if I succeed with this pilot, is it taking me where I want to go or should I be considering multiple channels? And so there's an opportunity to you know, kind of slow down to move fast and look at your different opportunities and maybe some you're not even thinking about. And that's where mentorship comes in of someone saying, hey, what you're building actually, instead of being a direct to consumer, there's a B2B to C channel over here that, that's uh, much more leveraged and you're not gonna go have to raise $20 million to do a consumer marketing campaign. And so it's really about having those eyes on the business, smart minds looking at it and then moving quickly. Um, so so that, that's, our, that, that's kind of our secret sauce of what people experience in program to try to accelerate what they're doing. And I would underline every single word of that because sometimes you're just so happy to have a customer, but it might not be the right customer in the long term. So there, here's a question. It would be great to have you speak about how you could participate in multiple accelerators and get SBIR to do so in an optimal way. Is there any recommendations? Because each incubator has its own focus and depending upon the mentors around that incubator, you could get more or less help. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, it's different tools in your toolkit for your, your time in a startup. And I, I you know, I, I think we've all, I, I think we've all had shared companies before. Like I noticed some of the companies on Rick's slide have been uh, uh, Techstars ones. I think the one, Mary, you were describing might've been a Techstars company as well. 
Um, and, and so by all means, um, uh, and, and companies coming out, you know, in and out of NIA, same thing. And, and so it's, it, you know, I don't want to necessarily say encourage every company to be a serial accelerator goer, because that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not a path Surf either. Accelerators. However, um, there, there are certain times when, when different of these offerings might be most applicable to you. And we're all working, you know, collectively on the uh, massive challenges in the space. So, uh, I, you know, I think, I think any of us would uh, refer out to the appropriate fit for where you are at that stage, whether it's before, after, or instead. Well, I know Vivo I spoke to this morning, and so we had encouraged them. So I'm very happy to, happy to hear that. But sometimes you hear of a company that has an e-commerce strategy, and there are incubators that really specialize in media or specialize in e-commerce. And of course, Steve Case is sort of the dean of all of this, since he wrote the book Startup Nation. Um, Rick, I think you've recently been in touch with Revolution Health, right? Uh, well, Re Revolution Ventures, yeah, uh, we are um, we are definitely in touch with them, and that's another um, kind of uh, what I teased earlier. That's going to be part of what we're be talking about uh, next week. So, yeah, to, to Keith's point, there are different stages, and and some startups we see going through various accelerators, which uh, is is okay as long as it's progressive, um, and we're pretty early stage. Um, accelerator, and there are those who are mid-stage, and if they're progressing from one to another, I think that that's fine. But um, it, it's like the the, the uh, student who never graduates. Um, <laughs> you know, you don't you don't want to get, get another PhD. Um, you got to get out into the world. So our goal is to uh, get great uh, modern products out into the world as quickly as we can. So. Um, it's not necessarily to spin them into another accelerator, um, unless it makes sense. And Mary, maybe maybe I could add, you know, from the SBIR side that we've seen it work both ways. And, and I encourage the panelists to add to this and give their opinion in terms of SBIR. SBIR can be great in terms of getting you some of that pilot data that may strengthen your applications to participate in the programs by the different panelists. Um, on the flip side, sometimes you'll end up in an accelerator first that will help you better to define what your value proposition, everything else is, and, and that'll put you at the way right place for SBR. So from my point of view, the, the order can be either or, you know, it can go in any direction, but I definitely open up to panelists on their thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, we, we got a living example of uh, one one now that I think is, uh, you know, Techstars first, uh, NIA uh, next, and, and I, I believe we've had some in the other direction as well, and, and I know other ones of our accelerators have uh, as well, so I think that's a great fit, and we, we uh, so yeah, I, I second that. Great. Um, Rick, part of what I was getting to with Revolution, I remember when Steve was at AOL and yeah. he really caused all of us to think that innovation and entrepreneurship doesn't just happen in the Silicon Valley. And these anchors issues around aging and caregiving, you know, China's a huge market too. And I know, uh, Keith, you've had some companies come out of your, out of Techstars who paid a lot of attention to diversity and the caregiving market. So it's it's very exciting to me to hear some of these issues. And you stay in the game for a while, you hear things like bed sores and it may not sound like a big issue, but it's a big issue, right, Mary? Um, so other- uh, yeah, A lot of, the, to, to your point, Mary, I think what you're getting at is, um, you know, entrepreneurs are attacking issues that the general populace is not necessarily aware of. Um, and bed sores is a good example, not sexy. However, it affects millions of people and it's a major, it's a major problem. Um, so, and, and there are scores of those that are unsolved. So if you're an entrepreneur and we talk to entrepreneurs, you know, recent college grads, trying to get them excited about this space, as well as uh, mature entrepreneurs, to get them to understand that not only is there a heck of a lot of money here, but there's a lot of good to be done. So there's a double bottom line as 
uh, well, pedaliosis likes to say, um, that, can, that can be achieved here. And that's a really nice thing uh, once uh, entrepreneurs kind of grok that. And it's something that we try to, uh, to definitely try to push. So as we have, we wind down our wonderful session, uh, let's share some words of advice to the entrepreneurs in the audience. So um, why don't we start with you, Keith? Oh, I mean, hats off to the entrepreneurs. I, I've been one most of my career. I now get to advise and, uh, you know, to, you know to get as much feedback as you can and you make the decisions though. Don't go by the feedback. You're the one in the arena and um, move quick. I think that, that would be it. That's it. That's your asset. Resources are your problem. Moving quickly and having no bureaucracy is your asset. And Mary. Surrounding. Um, yes, I, I agree that the person that has the passion and they know what they're after, uh, you want to you surround yourself with people that are going to support that. But at the same time, do a little pruning if what your desire is either too big uh, and, and finding, that, finding that way to get it to people that can give you the feedback. So it's who's going to be that mentor and who's going to be the folks that'll really give you valuable feedback so you can, you can make that happen. I think of so many people that uh, we've been able to have those conversations with it thrive and they've gone on to really succeed. So it's wonderful when you can get the right chemistry and mentorship going. And Rick. Uh, I would say uh, kind of uh, there's a lot of data out there and I would say lean on data, but rely on your gut. Um, and how do you establish that gut? Well, you can through years of working in the space or um, a shortcut is uh, spending time with your uh, desired customer to really understand them. Um, and uh, when I say spending time, I mean literally being there with them. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's a bit of advice I would give. Uh, so I always think it's a lot about the team. And I remember George Bell said, at one point in time, any point in time, you should be replacing one fourth year team and upgrading. So I love the data that you shared and these sources. We can all gather that and use that in our presentation. I love the insights about the business model, but find the best team and people around you and then build the best company you can and do it with a lot of listening and a lot of research and a lot of focus and drive and a lot of love. And then say thank you, because having colleagues like this, it's the best. It's the orchestra of talent and you'll just go the distance. So I wanna thank all of you, it's been fun. And uh, I'll turn it back to Todd and John, I guess. So. We're actually going back to Monique to introduce the next panel, but you guys were fantastic. Uh, that was great. Uh, and I, I think the accelerator is the bridge between customer partners and the capital that makes it fly. And so it's kind of a glue between the two pieces. So great, great job, guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everybody. Great, great applause. Thank you, everyone. Thank you everyone for sticking through with us. I think I hope you've been enjoying the conversation and just for those who may be joining anew, we are in the midst of our session developing and accelerating age tech and digital health solutions, perspectives and insights from C-suite leaders. We're gonna be moving into the last and final uh, session, which is focused on investors and distributors, scaling your venture. And we'll hear more about angel and seed funds, payers, healthcare systems, and distributors. Do want to remind folks that we're recording this session and we will make the recording available once we have it posted on our site and we'll send you an email about that. We'll also send you a, uh, some information that we've been chatting out via the links. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. Uh, I know that there are a couple of questions that we received in the last session that we'll try to catch up in the end of this session. Uh, so please keep them coming. With that, I would like to welcome our esteemed panelists and experts that we have with us today. So I'm delighted to welcome Monique Woodward. She is the founder and managing partner at Cake Ventures. We also have <coughs> Robert Garber, partner at Seven Wire Ventures. Jonathan Carl, he's the director of sales and business development at CDW Healthcare. 
And I will have a moderator, Lolita Robinson. She is uh, the entrepreneur residence at NIH Seed. And so uh, Dr. Robinson, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much. And I don't know about you all, but I think the previous two panel discussions were fabulous. So thank you all for such a wonderful conversation. And I think some of the things and some of the gems that you probably heard um, for the previous two, you'll likely hear repeats because some of the, you know, I was thinking, oh yeah, I'm gonna say that again and repeat that again because it totally hit home. So thank you all for that. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to the Investor and Distributor Scaling Your Venture Panel Discussion. Uh, my name is Lolita Robinson and I am one of the entrepreneurs in residence for NIHC. Um, I will be your moderator for today's fireside chat. Um, so thank you for joining us. And I hope that we will find this discussion informative and very useful. Um, as mentioned before, our panelists for today are myself, but also Monique Woodard from founder and managing partner at Cake Ventures, Robert Garber, partner at Seven War Ventures, and Jonathan Carl, director of healthcare sales of CDW Incorporated. So to frame our discussion and kind of set the tone, I would like to just kind of read some interesting insights about age tech. And it's particularly for those of you that might have just now joined instead of did, but didn't hear the previous conversation. So according to the UN, by 2050, one in six people in the world will be over the age of 65. Given that aging is a big and growing sector, it cannot be ignored. Whether it is a product aim at increasing mental stimulation or an app to coordinate who of the family members will drive an older family member to a medical appointment, these experiences fall into the age tech concept. Due to recent adoption and the longevity of gray and economy growth, the age tech market is well positioned and expected to grow. So for this panel, let's explore this a little further. Let's have a discussion and conversation about the future of age tech, investment and partnering and licensing opportunities. And let's talk about some ways startups and companies in this space can be successful. But before we begin the conversation, let's kind of meet our panel. And I guess I'll start. Um, I am Dr. Lolita Robinson. I'm a physician by training, but I do not practice. Um, I, over the past 20 years, maybe so, <laughs> I've had a variety of chief medical officer, medical director, and business development roles at various biotech medical diagnostics company. And along the way, I co-founded a medical diagnostics and a medical equipment export company. Most recently, I worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield, Nebraska as an entrepreneur in residence. And in that role, I sourced and evaluated healthcare technology for partnering and investment opportunities. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm one of the entrepreneurs in residence at NHC and where we basically support the NIH innovator community in their efforts to validate and commercialize their promising healthcare products. And in regards to age tech, so over the years I've worked and advised startup companies developing solutions for the care economy. So next I will turn it over to Monique. Introduction, please. Hi everyone, I'm Monique Woodard. I'm the founding partner and managing director of Cake Ventures. Um, we're an early stage venture firm focused on areas of demographic change that are changing the way that we invest in technology companies. Um, one of those areas of demographic change is of course aging. Um, as you all know, uh, our aging population in the US is uh, growing rapidly, 10,000 people turning 65 every single day. This is also a global opportunity. Um, you know, lots of aging countries, Japan, for instance, is the oldest developed country. Um, and uh, I invest in seed stage companies. I, I invest in my first aging related company in 2016 and I've been very active in this space ever since. And I also wrote the white paper on aging, Gray New World, um, uh, which is all about aging and technology and based on real data around how people expect to age, how they see themselves aging, and where they see technology um, helping that. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And Robert, how about you? Introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Hello. And my name is Robert Garber, and I'm a partner at Southern Wire Ventures. Uh, as you can tell from my background, I'm based in Chicago, and I am uh, Coming up on my 25th year as an early stage investor, all focused on healthcare and 
the intersection thereof, uh, and prior to that spent 10 years on the operating side. Uh, as an investor, our entire focus is wrapped around what we call the informed, connected health consumer. And this is really about how do we work with enterprise stakeholders, so payers, providers, employers, pharma companies, governments, um, but really with the idea of putting tools, technology, information in the hands of us so that we can be consumers and not patients. I don't think any of us really want to be patients. We want to have control. We want to have information. We want to be able to make smart uh, And among the areas of focus for us are really um, not only demographic shift to aging, but really how does that impact the idea of aging at home, right? So now more than ever, nobody would want to pair of one or themselves you put in a home. And so how do we think about um, leveraging some of these new tech-enabled services to bridge some of those caregiving gaps, to bridge, uh, to address loneliness and isolation, to address behavioral health needs, um, activities of daily living, you know, both the clinical and the non-clinical things that impact us having a high quality of late in life. So uh, I'm glad to be here today. Thank you. No, thank you for joining us. And John, take it home. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Jonathan Carl. I'm the Director of Sales and Business Development for CW Healthcare. Uh, I've been at the company about 23 years. I'm also based in Chicago, uh, or technically the Western suburbs. You're not supposed to say you're from Chicago if you don't live down there. Um, <laughs> but CW Healthcare, if you're not familiar, we're a mission forward, focused advisor and provider of end to end technology solutions uh, to the healthcare market of, of all shapes and sizes. Um, our business development team is focused on bringing the most relevant solutions to the healthcare marketplace, which incorporates both an acute and a post-acute side um, to our focus. So it incorporates senior care, home health, and rural care. Um, and as it relates to today, you know, we, we help startups extend their reach and scale by guiding them through the complexity of the technology and sales distribution uh, process and the overall market. Um, and that can be anything from, from the initial proof of concept uh, and how that aligns the industry to then broader market adoption through marketing and, and expanding on proof of concept deployments. All right, well, thank you for the introductions. And as you can see, we have quite a diverse panel ranging from VC investors, distribution, sales, and myself, payer and founder. So let's get started. So I'm gonna throw this out there. America's 65 and over population is projected to nearly double over the next three decades. And we've heard this before as well, from 48 million to 88 million by 2050. The world's population is getting older every day. As a result, more and more adults are able to better manage their lives and their health care through the power of technology. This evolution has ignited a whole new sector of technology. Monique, I'm gonna start with you. Why is age tech emerging now? Why not five years ago or five years from now? What's going on? So I think a few things happened. I think, you know, I think COVID accelerated a lot of um, our focus on, on aging tech and on healthcare broadly. But I think, you know, during COVID, we were very much um, presented with the fact that our healthcare system is not designed to, to handle the level of activity that we saw during COVID. And you know, that can that type of um, that type of healthcare strain can be extrapolated to an aging population as well. Right. And I I also think, you know, I'm I'm a very pragmatic person. You're talking about um, a group of VCs who are now entering the time of life in which they are now having to um, start thinking about how to take care of their aging loved ones. And so that has certainly brought the, the challenges and the opportunities into sharp relief for a lot of VCs who you know, maybe were not thinking about it before. So I think a lot of things happened all at the same time to make this the right time, um, and I think you know the amount of the amount of money in the market and the amount of uh, success, early success stories that that we are starting to see, like companies like Papa and Honor, um, have shown that this is a viable category to invest in. And so before we didn't have those markers of potential success, and I think that all of those things kind of swirling around together. Have created, you know, the perfect storm of 
uh, you know, that this is the time for a lot of people, investors in particular, to focus on aging. Yeah, I agree. I think COVID basically highlighted this, you know, where some people, we became co caregivers just overnight. And right. you know how that can just start. Once it starts is what do we do? I don't know what's going on. And then you have family members that are in other states that you could not get to. So what do you do on the ground? So I think too, for investors, it's a matter of, okay, I might've become a caregiver just in 24 hours. And now what I have to do. So let me understand this a little bit better. Robert, what about you? Do you have any thoughts around that? Why now? Why, 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 what's the interest? I think the last thing you said is pretty salient is that no matter how well educated, how smart we are, how schooled we are in healthcare, none of us have ever been trained to be caregivers, mm -hmm. um, but unpaid caregivers. And, and we can all talk from personal experience, either through our family or friends or loved ones, about what it's like to be sort of thrust into that role overnight and find out that you have no resources, you know, a limited support network, you know, and, and it's intimidating, it's expensive, it's overwhelming. Um, and so in some respects, I think it's it's a necessity that's just sort of, you know, emerged and exacerbated, certainly exacerbated the last couple of years, but even before that, I, we just, everybody's been talking about this sort of tsunami of, of the aging uh, demographic and know that we have a supply and demand problem, right? We're, there's going to be too much demand. There's not enough clinicians at any level to accommodate that demand. Um, most people don't have the savings required to pay for a lot of the care, even if it was there. Uh, and so we've got to figure out other scalable ways to, to solve this problem. And so, you know, historically, that generation, this older generation hasn't been the best at adopting technology, but technology has really come a long way. I mean, you know, over the last few years, even, we've just seen lots of new solutions that um, have democratized access, right, and make it really simple um, and easy for, for us and our loved ones to use everything from, you know, simple iPad apps to, you know, mobile technologies, uh, wearables, and, you know, different types of connectivity. And so I think it's a little bit of the perfect storm of all of it coming together. Um, you know, my guess is, sure, the fact that nobody in, the, in their right mind would have of one into an assisted living facility in the last year made us all really creative and, and ambitious to find solutions. Um, right. You know, so I, yeah, I think that we're having a moment in the sun. Um, I'm hopeful that it will continue because I think, you know, we're just scratching the surface of how to address the need of the population. And then I think the last thing is hopefully there's some, there's some rising emphasis on quality and not just quantity. Right, like we're a society focused on quantity of life, live as long as you possibly can, no matter what the quality is. And I'm starting to hear pockets in the market of, of a shift towards understanding what the role of quality is there. Um, and how can we make sure that people are living their best lives, not just their longest lives. Right, John, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll pile on that last thought on, on quality versus quantity. Um, a lot of aging tech prior, five, maybe 10 years ago, was a response to the, a problem. They were responding to a care problem in SNF or assisted living environment. Um, and it was a reaction. And the new generation, the next generation, the 10,000 seniors a day, that, that tsunami effect, they grew, they're more comfortable with technology already. They demand access to the technology. I mean, it could be something as simple as Netflix or, or, or a FaceTime with their grandkids. Um, but they're all of a sudden driving the consumer effect of the quality of what I'm experiencing needs to be better. How I age and thrive while I'm aging needs to improve. Um, so you now have the financial means and, and the comfort level with the utilization of technology that it becomes an expectation of the life I live. Mm -hmm. So I want to follow up with something. So Robert, you mentioned something about the supply and demand, and we have the workforce like a shortage, physicians and caregivers and whatnot. Do you think that's something that now is it, it's a it's a sector that hasn't had much exposure in the pre previous to COVID, or are we seeing more of it now because it's all out there for the world to see of this what's going on? But what, what's going on with that? What are your thoughts about that? Or anything that we can do in order to kind of solve this issue? Yeah, I, look, I think the cold, light of, the cold light of COVID this last year is trying to light on a lot of things. 
that were there. They're not new, right? These things didn't just up in the last 18, in the last 18 months. Um, I will say like, it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse, right? So the ability to, ex to access all of these tools and all these resources in some respects actually increases demand. And so we have to think creatively about how we address that, that increased demand, right? You know, we hear that all the time in behavioral health about the mental health crisis in our country. If there wasn't just a stigma, if there wasn't such poor reimbursement historically, if there wasn't such a shortage of uh, providers, like, and we actually uncovered all of the mental health issues in our country, we buried. We're already buried. Um, I think what's been interesting though on the age on the on in the aging population is how do we repurpose all the different types of constituents? And so it's not just doctors, it's geriatric health workers. Um, it's the PAPA example, non-clinical people solving activities of daily living and addressing loneliness and companionship. And so I think we have to think a little more holistically about how we treat the whole person and bring in some of these other resources that may be less traditional, but maybe in greater supply require less licensure, less education and training. I mean, my goodness, we know um, how long and hard it takes to create additional supply of just clinicians. Which mm -hmm. I mean, that they were looking at a recent medical school class, one of the major US med schools, and out of something like a few hundred students, only two had, had self-selected into primary care, right? So, so we know that we have um, an inability to manufacture supply overnight. So I think we just have to increase what that universe of community looks like and bring in some of those less traditional caregivers. Right. You know, I agree, you know, as a physician myself, you know, who I do not practice and I haven't practiced for many years, but I can tell you the number of calls that I received over the last couple of years. How do I get out of this? You know, are there any other opportunities career wise for me? I'm tired. I, I don't want to do this anymore. And it's sort of like, no, keep going, keep going, because we all can't leave at the same time, you know, so, you know, let's work with this. And so, I, you know, but even before the two years, I still had communications and calls with other, you know, physician friends and colleagues who were still trying to get out of it years ago. So you see what's happening many, many years before 2020 came about. And now it's just like tsunami, here it is. Now, what do we do? And so I, I, I just kind of look at that and just shake my head sometimes and say, I knew this was going to come and here we are. So what are we going to do about that? And it's going to be a challenge too. But I think that leads to some opportunities um, for some of these companies too, to explore. And, and speaking of that too, are there any really emerging or any key trends and opportunities that you predict in the future will have a significant impact on the aging markets in the next couple of years? What do you see as some of the biggest impact? And I will say, John, that's for you. So biggest impact um, that we're watching, again, from a, from a deploy and support the technology's impact on quality of life and quality of care, is the, the role of artificial intelligence and, and the data capture and data utilization. Um, you're the great resignation, right? We're seeing it, it's even more amplified in this space as, as we just mentioned. Um, you're, you're seeing large scale retirement of, of the most aged providers of care, um, or you're seeing a shift in, in home health, which is different than home care. Um, and in the home health, you are now capturing volumes of data, magnitudes of larger than what you were capturing in the acute care environment. So in the acute care environment, there might be capturing you know, your annual visits uh, on an ambulatory basis, and then they're capturing emergency care visits, which last on average two and a half days. The, the average time of data to capture spent in a post-acute environment, either a living environment, a CCRC or beyond, is measured in years, um, years of data. And so your ability to access that data and, and provide um, guidance either in the form of care, in the form of quality, um, and, and how that impacts life in terms of quality of life. Uh, and that could be all the way down to something as simple as a, as a wearable and, and, and prompting you to stand or walk or move to feeding uh, long-term data back into, a, um, back into the, the caregiving environment so that they can avoid visitation to a hospital, they can avoid visitation to the, the primary care because they're under shortage. So any strain you can take off that environment and improve quality of life is like, that's the double whammy. Absolutely. Monique, 
you know, your gray new world, the 2020 aging report that you mentioned earlier, I had an opportunity to read it. And it was a fabulous read. And thank you so much for those of you who have not, please have access to this. I think it's a great read. Speaking on the same question about key trends and opportunities, what anything that you think from that particular publication or from what you're seeing now, do you think in a couple of years, we we'll think, ah, oh, this is gonna be what we need? I mean, my answer is very similar to John's. I think remote patient monitoring mm -hmm. is kind of, you know, the direction that, that we're all moving in. You know, I think one, patients um, or older adults, you know, who are not patients yet just want it, right? They want to be able to send data into their private care physician, their primary care physician, or they want to be able to send it into, you know, some other data repository that ends up getting bubbled up to their primary care physician when there is a potential issue um, that can be uh, cut off before it becomes an issue. Um, so I think platforms that enable uh, this kind of remote monitoring is where I'm spending a lot of my time and, and have already invested in, into mm -hmm. you know, a company in that space. So I think you know, that plus, the, again, the amount of data that is going to come from those re remote patient monitoring devices uh, mm -hmm. is, is kind of the name of the game for me. Yeah, and, and I agree, you know, when I had worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield, it was the remote patient monitoring, you know, it's kind of like, oh, this is interesting, let's take a look. And then all of a sudden here's COVID. Okay, <laughs> fine, <laughs> patient monitoring company, we need to figure this out. Right. So Def, I agree with that too. And I think there's something there. And I, some of the conversations from earlier, it mentioned, hey, just because they're senior does not mean they do not have, know how to use technology. A lot of them had to go through telehealth and use these platforms at home during COVID and now I've gotten used to it. So now what do we do? Let's keep them going. And so I agree, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the remote patient monitoring. I would love to see the yeah. different innovations around that. And the so, data I collected so <laughs> in Gray New World was collected before COVID. And even then, um, you know, the respondents overwhelmingly indicated that they wanted to be able to mm -hmm. uh, share data with their physicians. They mm -hmm. wanted to be able to use more technology. They they, you know, they wanted the telehealth that was, you know, soon to come. Um, so these were already desires. And, and now we've just kind of accelerated the adoption in, in a major way. Yeah, absolutely. So with age tech, you know, it's growing, but it both in terms of R&D and investor and partnership interests. So Robert, you know, as an investor, you know, what segments of age tech are you looking for? What, what do you what do you want, you know, and, and to invest in? What are what are some companies that pique your interest? Yeah, I mean, look, largely speaking, anything that keeps people out of the four walls of the hospital, right? And so it, it, it's not just RPM, it's also innovations in home health, right? The the acuity of, of care that we can now provide in the home is is really remarkable. I mean. You know, it started off with just sort of home nursing care, and now there's hospital home and there's home dialysis, and we were looking the other day at home infusion therapies. So, I think, you know, there's a breadth of service that will lead to lower costs, better experience, more convenience, better compliance. Uh, you know, I mean, the simple things that we need to do to lower costs, improve outcomes, is keep people compliant, be proactive and preventative. Um, you know, and so I think anything that allows us to get in front of chronic disease is a win, is a win, right? So, so the problem we have in our country is too many of them are polychronic, complex, expensive, have multiple doctors, have multiple ED visits and hospitalizations a year. And so if we can leverage some of these solutions to get in front of that, I think that has the biggest economic impact um, for sure. Uh, I think the other thing we've been thinking about is trying to avoid thinking of age tech or the senior population as, mm -hmm. as monolith, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody who's 65 and just <laughs> sort of, you know, retirement age and someone who's 85 are in very different situations. Um, and we've seen a lot of interesting technologies trying to leverage some of the younger part of that age bracket mm -hmm. to the older part of that age bracket. Um, and this isn't, you know, necessarily people providing nursing care, but when we think about, you know, transportation or food delivery or 
you know, picking up medications or companionship or what have you, you know, there's a huge labor pool of people who are not quite ready to quote unquote retire, uh, but can be part of the solution. Um, but I think it really all boils down to, to keeping people out of the most expensive part of the system, which is, you know, rotating in and out of the hospital and from provider to provider to provider. Um, you know, and, and, and frankly, like that sounds a lot easier said than done. I mean, mm-hmm. it's hard enough to treat a patient who has one chronic condition, let alone two or three or four. And as you get older, we all know most people are on, I forgot the last number was like the average senior citizen takes 12 medications, has three chronic conditions. You know, I mean, these are expensive, complete, complex people. So I, I think that's really the question is, can we improve outcomes and reduce costs and do it outside the four walls? Um, there are lots of technologies that, that enable that, but I think we need to focus on solving the problem and who's paying for it, right? You know, there's plenty of things that I like as a consumer that I, that I don't want to pay for, or at least our country has not accustomed to paying for it, right? And so we need to think, who else are we solving the problem for? Is it the payer? Is it the provider? You know, is it the employer or what have you? Because they're going to largely bear the cost of these, of these expenses. Yeah, great points. And, and to something you mentioned earlier about expanding sort of the, the time here, you've got those that are 65 and sometimes it could be the care recipients, but what about those caregivers and those Gen Xers and older millennials? You know, you cannot forget about us as well as we're going to be those people eventually down the line. So I think there's a whole opportunity to, to expand that spectrum of the age group. So that's a great point. John, what about CDW? What are you guys are looking for in terms of, you know, hot activities and hot topics right now? It's interesting that you say that the expanding of the view of it, the continuum of care is, I consider myself to be the decision-making child. Mm-hmm. Um, I happen to be a technology advisor, so I can get away with it when it comes to advising my, <laughs> my, my senior parents. Um, <laughs> but it's just that. It's who is, do you know your audience? So what I look for, everything that was just discussed is, is front and center from a, from a product and solution standpoint, the dimensions we have to look at are who's willing to invest in it from a customer side, not from a, not from a development side. And so am I impacting quality of life? Am I impacting um, expansion, extension of life? But also I have to go down the financial side of it, right? So I have to look at, am I, is it a cost reducing solution? Uh, is it cost enhancement? Can I improve census in my environments? Uh, is it making my environment more attractive than my competitors? So there is that dimension of, of this, which gets away from the caregiving and, and, and the quality of life discussion and moves into financial metrics. So at the end of the day, you do need to boil down those metrics. Um, can I reduce fall risk and the, qu- the quantity of falls? And can I convert that into a number? Yeah, yes, I can. A CFO can tell you, if you can cut my fall percentages by 25%, I will save X dollars. And I can then invest those dollars in more of that technology. Um, you also need to understand who you're and what you're competing with. In a lot of um, technology solutions, aging technology, you're competing with another brand that does a similar thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not necessarily the case in an aging environment. They're trying to determine whether they want to spend their money on infrastructure for wireless so that you can use tablets, or mm-hmm. perhaps they want to spend that money on a new cafeteria for better quality of food. You're not necessarily competing like to like. You're, you're often mm-hmm. in apples and oranges. And there's a finite amount of money that's going to go into the investment of the, of, of the environment um, or the community. And, and you'll often have, um, you know, mm-hmm. customer facing events where they're trying to figure out for their community leaders because they're going to have their own board, their own voice. Mm-hmm. We want to spend the money here. Um, and you're often having to show the community themselves. This is why this is so important for you. Um, which doesn't always align to what the CFO or the financial side of it might be looking at. Right. Monique, any th- great job. Thank you, John. Monique, what about you? You're on mute. <laughs> it's like there it's my go. first day <laughs> using Zoom. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, remind me of the question. I just got yeah. flustered. No, that key, key segments um, investors are interested in right now. So types of companies that you are looking for, anything that piques your interest, it comes at your desk. 
Yeah, I, I'm also really interested in how, um, you know, taking a step away from healthcare, I think, you know, there's, there can occasionally be the desire for um, people to think of aging as, as only a healthcare problem, but there's mm-hmm. also a, a financial problem or, or a financial opportunity there as well, helping people figure out how to better uh, save for retirement before they get to the age of retirement, right? How do we help them better save, um, you know, create new financial products that help them manage their money up to and then beyond retirement, mm-hmm. um, by, you know, products that help them uh, create, I, I'm a big fan of Trust and Will, the company, companies that help them create a mm-hmm. trust and a will, um, you know, work with their financial advisors, um, because there's, there's a lot of life to be, to be lived and it's not just a, you know, how do we help people who are, are sick or about to be sick, but how do we help people live very, very full lives? And, and there's a financial imperative there as well. You know, one of the things Robert mentioned earlier really stuck with me. One of the things that I think about is, you know, we're, we're in the period of, of this one, the great resignation but also a huge brain drain on a lot of our companies and corporations of people now moving into retirement who hold a ton of the knowledge that existed inside those companies, right? And so how do we help people um, if they decide they don't want to retire, Mm -hmm. um, continue to lead um, uh, productive lives in the workplace alongside all of the all of the generations who are now in the workplace, how do we help those people all work together? That's also a huge part of aging and of the future of work that is related to, you know, uh, a lot of people getting older and, and deciding not to leave the workforce. Yeah, I agree. And you, you mentioned something about the non-healthcare aspect of this, and you mentioned like job training, upskilling. That's something that I've been interested in as well, because, you know, sometimes you're Previously, you were kind of forced out of the, of the system. It's like, okay, but I'm not ready to retire and I don't want to take this extra low wage right. job and I have all of these skills. What am I supposed to do? So I think there's a really interesting opportunity in order to support those folks with different job skills and training and things of that sort to keep them mm-hmm. in the market. So I, I agree with that as well. But what about something like I'm home sharing, like Silver Nest and those type of uh, companies as well? Any thoughts on those as well? Too? Definitely. I think those are really interesting new models. Um, Silver Nest for sure. Um, there's a, a new company um, that is in the new Techstars cohort as well that is related to home sharing. There's also Nesterly who has been around for mm-hmm. quite some time. Um, so I think, you know, home sharing is something that a lot of people uh, have sort of taken a run at from a, from a startup perspective. And you know, your home is, is often usually your biggest asset, right? And so how do we help people stay in their homes for as long as they desire, age in place when and where appropriate, and continue to uh, retain the financial upside of that home? Um, and I think that there's a lot still to be done there and a lot still to be discovered. Yeah. Thank you, definitely. So, you know, the last two years has been really quite interesting time for age tech startups. So despite all of this, Crunchbase reports that 40 age tech companies raised 368 million between January and September of 2020. Some companies that relied on in-person experiences faltered, others pivoted, launched new products or features and leveraged an unprecedented event to grow the business. Any advice for researchers, entrepreneurs focused on the aging well market, given where we are today? What's some good advice? And John, I'm going to start with you. Sorry, I was muted too. Um, So where to begin um, or even where to focus? You know, there's a ton of opportunity in the services side of all this. Um, I think we were talking, you know, we've been talking more about it seems that you end up talking about a solution to a problem that is a, a product, a platform, mm-hmm. uh, something along those lines. Um, the other side of all this is um, how we support all this. And we've, we've hit the, the staffing shortages. We all know about that, the brain drain mm-hmm. that just got brought up. 
you need um, investment and there's investment opportunity to expand in just that is, is how do we bring all this to bear? How do you scale all of this? Um, because you can build the greatest thing that the market's seen and either no one's going to know or no one's going to know how to use it. And that's the other challenge is it's, 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 we, we've hit this already, right? Um, there's a, there's a cool tagline for senior, senior length, um, old people are cool. And it's <laughs> their view of don't assume they don't know how to use technology. Most do. Mm -hmm. Um, and so get that out of your head first, right? That was the last five years. Now it's about, okay, but everybody else around them needs to know how to use technology. Um, and so the people they're interacting with the, the different areas they're interacting with, and, and that's the real opportunity set to say, okay, how do we bring to bear the services behind all that? Um, you're seeing some environments go that like the Apple store route, they, they install the genius bar. Um, and there's a resident expert on all things agent tech. Um, you will see some retail, but they, they've had a lot of misfires. Um, they're, they're trying to kind of put a um, aging tech in a box for, for the home. And it's a misfire because it's, it's, it's too finite to itself and it, it doesn't necessarily play well with others. So the interoperability of all of these things that we're talking about is also kind of imperative. So um, I'm seeing expansion in just that. The, the organizations that are not necessarily creating the solution they're making the solution work across the continuum or they're making the solution um, <laughs> interoperable for lack of, you know, to keep playing on that path, um, <laughs> but then support it. And so they're providing education and online learning and videos online of, of how to use the technology or, or tips and tricks, um, both for user and for, for the provider side. So getting all of this to work uh, seamlessly it is a tremendous opportunity. Yep, I, I agree. The interoperability has, ugh, is an issue forever. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, what can we Big do bubble. about this? <laughs> like, no. Can we start there first? <laughs> Absolutely. Robert, any thoughts? Any advice you have for your, you know, for a new startup? I have this great idea. What do I do? You know, help me out here. It's interesting. The, the, my knee jerk reaction we just provided here was like, what a pittance that is relative to the amount of funding that's gone on in digital health over the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. So clearly this is an underinvested area um, by any measure. Uh, I'd say that the things that always sort of, say, you know, <laughs> the simple advice I always find myself falling back on, right? If you find your way into the existing funds flow, creating brand new existing funds flow is really, really hard. Um, and two is think really strategically about your go-to-market, right? You're going to create scale in a cost-effective way. As you said, John, like there have been a lot of direct-to-consumer approaches. Many of them are hardware-focused, um, not a lot of traction there. Um, people selling into senior living communities, which depending upon who you're talking to, haven't had a lot of strength on their balance sheets right now to invest in new technologies. And so I think you got to follow who has the means, the resources, and the motivation to adopt new technology. Um, and then how do you get how do you get utilization, right? Like you know, so these commercial agreements we see are are bona fide hunting licenses, right? It just gives you access to a population of lives or members, yeah. or however you want to term it. But then you have to activate them, right, and engage them and empower them. And do so on, on an ongoing basis. I mean, if we're really going to change some of these expensive questionable behaviors, you know, we're going to have to, to figure out how to create durable change, which is really, really hard to do. Um, but I think that's really what ends up bending the cost curve. Um, and so that's not, I said the last thing is like, and I, this is my own view, so feel free to disagree, is like, I personally stay away from the hardware. I've seen so many hardware solutions come and go. Not only do they not work together, and so there's this interoperability piece, but the technology changes. Um, you can get out innovated by all the big consumer electronic players. Um, it's expensive. Um, it's hard to scale. People don't like using it. People don't like wearing things. It, it just the number of times where I think that there's a hardware solution to it, only to learn an expensive lesson. I can count on multiple hands, and so. Um, that's not to say that I don't think the hardware is a piece of the puzzle, but if I'm advising entrepreneurs, like to me, I don't, I don't think that's the, you know, that's part of an ecosystem play, but I don't think that that's the solution. 
right? I think, you know, they have a broader platform approach where hardware makes sense. But to me, what's most important about the hardware is the data, not the hardware. What can I do with the exhaust? All the devices on me, in my home, in my car, wherever it is. And then how do I leverage intelligence to understand what I can do with that data? Like to me, how data, as long as it's passively collected, is kind of, I just want as much of it as possible. And I want to analyze it as hard as I can to create actionable insights. Um, so so things that I think about when, I look, when, I, when I'm looking at opportunities today. Very good. And just to move on, I know we have some time to consider, but John, there's a question I want to talk to you about as being a distributor in sales. You know, let's, let's talk about what are some of the things that you think companies should be thinking more long-term in order to scale their business and expand their business with a partner like you? Yeah, there's a few kind of requirements or, or must-haves, if you will, that, that hold people back from migrating, from moving from kind of startup to, to mature, to scaling out to the, you know, a, a, someone of my size that sales on a national basis, if not an international basis. Um, and not, they're not necessarily technical, but it, they might sound a little technical, but knowing the security and safety of your product. So Robert just mentioned passive monitoring. RPM, Monique mentioned that as well. Um, it's going to be there. We're going to get data from it. You better know how to secure it. You better know where it's going and where it's going to get delivered, who has access to it. How secure is it? You know, even if something as simple as the vaccine data, um, people are very sensitive of what you're collecting and who can see it. And so above all, I would say I see a lot of really good ideas try to come to market that don't have a strong enough security answer. Yeah. Um, and that can even be just a, an immutable backup and recovery platform is like table sticks. Um, and it's being amplified right now because of all the attacks on not just healthcare, but specifically on the aging population. Um, they're, they've become prime targets for ransomware, cyber crimes, et cetera. Um, so, so you kind of have to have a real bulletproof answer there. And then more, that's more maybe to the, to the end user's data, but to then to the back end of it is the infrastructure. And, and, and Robert, I think you mentioned at the very beginning, and then it was also mentioned in the prior two panels. The infrastructure is not there. The average age of, of, a, of a senior environment, a living environment is over 20 years old. Um, they're aged, they're old. The infrastructure is old. Um, they may not be easy to upgrade. You might, you know, it's, it's they're not necessarily friendly for, you know, bolt on upgrades of technology. Um, so understanding that environment, and that was, I think Mary Furlong said that earlier, you need to live a day or more than a few days, live a while in these environments to truly understand how you have to come at them. Know their infrastructure limitations, less than um, less than 30%, or maybe it's even, it might be a little higher these days, but a couple of years ago, it's less than 30% of all living environments, 65 and older, had wireless. So if your platform runs on a wireless, you know, it, it needs a wireless infrastructure because it's a device, it may not work. Um, and that was one of the panelists earlier mentioned, you know, deploying tablets to, to their residents and it failed. It failed because they had no infrastructure to support the, the, the scale of the demand. If you're a, a Comcast user, you lived that firsthand this morning across the country. Um, people all of a sudden didn't have TV, phone or internet. And it was only a couple hours for, for my little neighborhood, but people were going crazy. Um, that was just a couple hours. Imagine just not at all. Yeah. So those are the two big ones, I would say. You know, knowing how it's going to work in the volatility of that environment um, and then the security. Of it. Great. Any other thoughts from the other, from Monique, Robert, and uh, how these companies can scale? Because that seems to be always the issue. It's like they got this idea, they've got this MVP, we got a market. Okay, but how do you take it to the next level? Any advice for them? John, just one thing on your point. We, uh, it's so funny the number of times I've had this discussion about wireless and we almost never want to look at anything that people haven't connected to the cellular network because Wi-Fi is such a disaster and Bluetooth is such a disaster when you put it in the field and you tell people how to connect it, it doesn't work. I mean, it's, and the problem is, is that the cellular approach is from an engineering perspective, more expensive. The form factors can't be as small. You have to pay for the data, you know, access. And so, you know, we're not there yet, but like, 
we've been we've seen companies taken down by that that one issue alone. Yeah. Appreciate you bringing that up because sometimes we forget about just like the table mm-hmm. stake, like wow. the, the basic blocking and tapping while we're trying to solve the whiz bang solution. You know, we, we you know we forgot to put a door on the house. Um, you know, all too all too often. <laughs> Yeah, Monique, I see you smiling over there. Anything, any lasting words? <laughs> no, I just, I just really love that analogy. I forgot to put a door on the house. Uh, I just really <laughs> like that. I thought it was very apt. Um, no, I think, you know, I think what everyone is saying is that founders and companies have to really immerse themselves in the problems that they're actually trying to solve and really come at it. Yes, we need innovation, but we also need um, a, a true understanding of the lived experience of the customers that they're trying to solve problems for. And I think, you know, the question to, of how do we help these companies scale, you know, scale comes with true understanding of company, of, of the problem, the customer set and the problems first. You know, I see so many companies, yes, within the aging space, but also in other spaces that I um, that I invest in, where, you know, the the company has just sort of remixed a solution for an aging population by, you know, repurposing something that you know is not related to aging, right? And that isn't necessarily the way to solve the problems of aging it, of an aging population. It's really having something that is uniquely suited to speak to the problems and the challenges and the opportunities that you're seeing. And I don't think it's slapping, you know, oh, and this is now for aging onto Mm -hmm. existing solutions. It's actually really going deep and understanding the challenges that you're, that you're up against. Yeah. And I I agree with that. I think some of the companies that I've I've worked with before and, and even working from the payer side as well, you see so many companies that honestly have, it's like go from the beginning where they have not even, they don't even know their customer at this point. And um, let's start there. You know, that customer validation discovery goes a long way. And I'm talking more so than your two cousins who love your technology and think this can be the next big thing. But go, like, I think it was mentioned before in the other panels, like be there, know who they are, know where they are, and you need to be there and really dig deeper. And it's not just over the weekend, who is a little focus test? No, you need to spend that the life of the company. And I think a lot of times we ran into that um, quite a bit as we were kind of sourcing companies early on. So I would encourage companies, you know, do your homework, <laughs> you know, please go that way too. Um, so I know we're right up on time, but so here's what I'm, last question for us. Um, is there anything, this is the home panel, is there anything that we missed or you would like to leave with the audience? We have a lot of researchers, entrepreneurs out there. Anything you would like to say? Um, I think I just add, um, before you put your, your toe in the water, before you, you need to define what success looks like, right? You need to, you need to understand what, is there or there or there? And um, and this is unique to age tech, by the way, but I, I think particularly in this business um, with this population, it's so complicated and expensive. Um, and you have multiple constituents and multiple points of care in addition to being um, in the home. And, and I think it's important that you understand, what, you know, how do you measure your success in an objective way, right? People have a really hard time making buying decisions on soft dollar ROI, right? reduced absenteeism, improved productivity, you know, these things that we hear about, but they want to see, I mean, John mentioned, where's the dollar being saved, right? Um, Because that's where the hard dollar ROI is. And so I really think it's important for people to focus on the metrics um, and what, what, uh, and creating a, a defensible objective framework for showing what success looks like before you get into it, right? We have things like, Never do a pilot unless A, you've defined what the success metrics are, and B, you have an upfront commercial agreement to expand that contract if you hit those metrics. Mm -hmm. One is you're going to figure out what's important. And two, you're going to shake out whether people are kicking the tires or whether they have really a commitment to grow grow with you, right? And like, none of us want to be stuck in pilot land. And so, you know, save yourself the anguish of having a successful pilot and never getting into a commercial launch. 
by defining those things up front and contracting that way so they can understand that, look, mm-hmm. we said do A, B, C, and D. We did A, B, C, and D. So let's, you know, I want not just 5,000 patients at the start. I want the 25,000 people behind that or the 100,000 people behind that. So I just think a little bit of that planning um, and analysis up front goes a long way. Absolutely. John. You know, there's um, probably two things I I throw out there. Um, One is there's a lot of information hitting this space. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's emerging. It's got a lot of investment coming in behind it. There's a lot of money on both sides, the consumer side, the user side, the provider side. Um, And it's easy to get lost in the noise. And so my advice on that is the, the panelists today, many of many of them, I know personally, um, and the moderators today, I, I mean, I know personally, have access and can get you access at, 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 as, as a goodwill gesture to get you started and rolling. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily require massive investment to get good guidance. Um, and Mary Haynes mentioned Thrive earlier. You know, that's an organization that is there to do just that. Um, and they are connected and that group is connected in with all the right people and places. Um, and so even if it's just getting guided to the right starting point or the right starting group, um, don't be afraid to ask and, and ask everyone and every, you know, as you go. Um, because I, John mentioned this earlier, John Reiner mentioned it, that, you know, most of us in this part of the, of the healthcare flow are, it's, it's about the value we got of it as well. Uh, knowing that we're doing good and that we're having impact. Um, and so we're eager to help and share because if we see that potential um, in the solution or product or an idea, we want to get it out there. We want to help impact the quality of life of people. Um, and it's not necessarily the, uh, the hyper competitive landscape of other markets where there's constant competition against that. If anything, in our, in, in our, in our world, it's a smaller tight knit world of people that speak this language uh, of bringing technology into the care space, the senior care space specifically. Um, and there's a lot of people here to help. Absolutely. And network, network, network. Do not do right. this alone. There, <laughs> like you mentioned, there's so many people and resources out there. Accelerators, you got Thrive, you got Techstars. They're there. And even when you're looking for investors, don't just ask questions, you know, reach out to people and don't just sit in your home office and be like, okay, let me do everything by myself. No, you got to get out there. So I encourage you all to do that too. Monique, take it home. <laughs> Um, I think that, you know, there are a lot of big, hairy problems to be solved uh, in within the aging category as a whole, and a ton of really, you know, passionate, mission driven entrepreneurs who are out there trying to launch companies to solve some of them. Um, You know, I think really thinking through the fundamentals of building a a business around these problems and building something that is sustainable and really thinking about how to go to market and what the proper what the what the best channels will be for you to get to the customers that you want to actually get to um, is imperative and so um, you know I think mixing that passion with like good, strong business fundamentals will get you to a place where you are building a truly transformative business. Thank you. Thank you for that. So thank you to the wonderful panel. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think we have several questions. So I'm gonna turn this over to Monique. Um, Anything, yeah, do we have those? I think about five questions. Yes, thank you so much. And, and thank yes. you to everyone here today. We really appreciate everyone hanging on and as well as all of our experts who have joined us. Um, I just wanted to remind folks to please fill out the feedback form if you haven't done that already and connect with us on Twitter and LinkedIn. A couple of questions that we received. Um, one is, um, what about uh, more information about underserving, serving underserved minority communities, specifically Spanish speaking older adults? Can you speak to that market opportunity? And I will, any one of the panelists can answer this. I can give a short one on the distribution side is that there are distributors um, and, and integrators like myself that, that do have very specific DEI initiatives. 
and and serve those communities specifically, both on the um, serving the, the 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 consumer side, but also serving uh, working with um, diverse uh, organizations on the back end as well. So kind of on the entire continuum of it, and you should seek out distributors that have very clear initiatives and then leverage that. Um, because they have to run the continuum of being able to serve it kind of from end to end. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, you know, companies, fairly early ones out there that I know of who are, you know, taking on the, the healthcare in, in multiple languages um, challenge. You know, Me Salute is one of them. And then there's... Um, uh, there's another one that I'm forgetting the name of, um, but they are out there. Uh, I think, I think it's, it's a more, it's a very much an early category and early opportunity, but I, I see it as really big. Um, and it certainly folds into one of the other areas of cake ventures, which is, you know, rise of a new majority where people of color are the majority in the U S. Um, so I think, I think there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of remaining opportunity out there for people who are thinking in multiple language and cultural competency in a lot of these areas. Thank you. Another one of our participants has asked if you have any insights from the panelists on where to go to find support and resources as well as investors for delivering online family caregiver services. Yeah, I mean it's a good question. I don't know if that I don't know if that list of resources is any different than for any other solutions that would be, you know, focused on this on this market. Uh, I feel like forums like this are designed to raise the awareness uh, of people focused on the age tech market, um, and you know, almost all of the solutions that we're talking about, the companies we're looking at, are trying to leverage some sort of online care for family caregiving, um, you know, so I don't know specific resources. Uh, I, I think the way I think about it is look for those two different pockets of people I look for. One is start with the companies in the market that have been already received funding um, and work backwards and see who their, who their partners are, who their investors are, um, any of the nonprofits, organizations with which they partner um, and work backward that way. I think the other approach is to look at a category of investors called impact investors, which you know put social welfare above capital gains, and that's a very specific set of investors out there. But you're going to find you know a very mission driven group of people in that community uh, who uh, would be a good good to reach out from a network perspective. I think those are the two ways I think to, to reverse engineer this because it's still it's hard to believe it, like but I still feel like it's a bit of a cottage industry. People talk a lot about all these aging solutions, but when we think about the total dollars put out, it's still pretty small. I mean, that's, um, especially in this environment. So I, I... Thank you. We also received a question and I'm gonna encourage uh, the participants to reach out to us directly to maybe set up some time to connect, but they're looking at how to best leverage the SBIR CTR program, factoring the timing and, um, you know, moving through the program for digital health solutions. That's something we are interested in. And we'd encourage you to schedule some time to meet with our program officer one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. And with that, I did want to just see if John Reinhardt wanted to say a few comments before we close out. Well, this was a fantastic day and a fantastic two-part series. I'm honored that uh, you all would share your time and talent and uh, inspirations with us. I, I, I couldn't thank for the better co-moderators on the panel today. And again, on behalf of the NIH team and my colleagues at NIA specifically, um, this was our experiment. This was our foray into, into bringing together collaborative learning around uh, digital health and age tech and to give guidance to our uh, portfolio companies, future portfolio awardees uh, on the nature of this space and how they can be successful. We have a lot of programs and interest. And as I always say with NIA, as I joined the team, it's the largest uh, seed funder through awards that uh, is unknown. And uh, unknown is a, a, a comment that means, you know, we're getting known more, but 
you know, 135 million of commitment a year of non-dilutive capital towards uh, in, enhancing successful ventures that improve life. And that's really what we're excited about. Thank the Ogilvy team and all the people that were behind the scenes. And uh, for that, we look forward to your feedback and this will be the beginnings of more tools to come. And we hope to engage with all of you soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much, John. Oh. And thank you to all thank the you. panel. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And just a quick take home, uh, please schedule a meeting with your EIR. We've included the Calendly link Two, Please fill out the feedback form. We yeah. value insight and we want to plan the future programming, but we want it to be informed about what you need. Three, join us for our next upcoming event. We're going to focus on pitching and promoting the company. And then four, I'll just say connect with us. So please uh, join us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And again, uh, you know, schedule those one-on-one -on -one meetings. But thank you to our speakers. Thank you to all of you who have stuck in with us. We really appreciate your time and talents. Be well.